Hello, uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Um, welcome to the first edition of the Robocon conference. I wanted to say a warm hearted thank you all for being here and for participation in our event. This is uh, the, the first time that we've been doing such a conference. So it's uh, very, very important to me personally and to my team and uh, to the whole organization team uh, that you have made it here so far and uh, hopefully for all the people that will be uh, reviewing this uh, in the future on online. Uh, thank you also for joining us and deciding to take a look at what we have in store for you. So um, first, I wanted to say that my name is Adam Hepner. I'm the, the brain behind this uh, whole operation. I uh, was part of the initiation committee and uh, I've uh, actually proposed that we make the conference but I wouldn't have been able to uh, to do it without my uh, my team and um, my my team members so thank you all uh, for your support and uh, your hard work um, to make it happen uh, and I also <clears throat> wanted to thank all 100 over 160 people that decided to join our conference. Uh, part of you are already here. Part of you hopefully will join uh, during the day. Mm, but I hope you will all have a great time with us. Um, a couple of words uh, about who will be caring about you today. Mm, I already introduced myself, but on the backstage is also one more uh, team member Jerzy Głowacki, uh, he's a senior uh, test automator uh, at our company and uh, he will be supporting me in uh, coordinating and uh, choreographing this whole event. Mm. Before we start with the first presentation, uh, I wanted to take the time to tell you why we are doing it in the first place. Mm. Basically, mm, our company is uh, using robot framework quite extensively for um, for our customers. And uh, we do the community on the inside. So we share knowledge uh, between one another. And uh, we lacked the community outside of, uh, of our company, but inside Poland. Mm, the idea of Robocon, the conference that uh, takes place online and in Helsinki every year is uh, very dear to us. We 
also sent uh, our team members to, to Helsinki last year to participate. Um, and we thought <clears throat> maybe we should not complain about there not being enough community, but uh, rather be the change that we want to see in the world. So uh, the idea brewed in my mind uh, for quite a long time. And uh, after the holidays, uh, we finally decided to um, take it to our boss and propose that we get cracking and get going with the, uh, the organization. And it was very little time. And uh, therefore, I'm all the more grateful for, for it uh, all to have worked out uh, so well in the end. I wanted to thank all the partners that decided to participate in uh, the promotion of the end uh, of the event. So uh, this will be our company, Nice Project, but also the company Cap Gemini, Cap Gemini um, from Wrocław. Uh, I would also thank, uh, like to thank the Robot Framework Foundation for their blessing and uh, partnership. Uh, I know we are not an official event from the foundation, but uh, the blessing that uh, Mika Salmola gave us uh, was very, very important and very um, gave very much credibility to our initiative. I would also thank, uh, like to thank our uh, media partners, uh, the companies Testage.pl and the brand Testage.pl, as well as all the various communities, uh, testing communities from Poland that uh, also published our, uh, our information and uh, our plan. Uh, what do we have in store for you? Uh, a little bit about the organization. Uh, at 9.15, uh, if I stop talking, uh, we will have a talk by Mika Salmola about the Robot Framework Foundation and how the foundation itself is um, responsible for enabling the further development of the Robot Framework tool. Um, I think it is a very interesting talk and uh, Mika goes into some details about how uh, we can support the community, not only in Poland, but globally. Uh, then at 9.45, uh, we'll have a talk uh, by Lina Zubita from uh, German um, company Doodle AG um, about how minimalism in the toolset helps teams build high quality products. Uh, I have had occasion to uh, meet Lina uh, personally, and uh, I think that she has quite a lot of good points in this talk uh, and it is uh, worthwhile to, to listen to what she has to, uh, to say. Then at 10.35 we have a talk by Krzysztof Żminkowski about uh, integrating uh, RunnerX and Robot Framework. Um, this has a lead theme of um, making a continuous effort to improve the toolset that we work with. Uh, and the long and hard path that we took uh, to, to integrate those two tools together. At 11.25, uh, I will give a quite long talk about uh, the robot framework critique, uh, so playing the devil's advocate for a moment, or not. We, this is for you to decide. And at 12.30, we'll have a lunch break for a one hour. At 1.30, Igor Czerski will present uh, how to make your work easier with Robot Framework, not only by automating testing, but also by automating some other um, areas of our daily work. Uh, so uh, he will delve deeper into the uh, robotic process automation part of robot. And uh, at the end, at 2 o'clock, Agnieszka Żminkowska from Capgemini will uh, share some tips and tricks from her team, how she managed to um, speed up the, uh, the testing process in her team, in her project. After each session, there are five minutes for uh, question and answers. So I would encourage you all to ask questions. You will see that uh, on the right side of the interface of our platform, there's place for chat polls and Q&A. I encourage you all to um, prepare questions and ask them. We will uh, ask these questions for, for uh, the talk, uh, the presenters. Um, except Lina Zubita, who unfortunately uh, reported today that she's stuck in the train uh, around uh, Hanoi. So I guess she's 
seeing the towers of Hanoi for herself and uh, she won't be able to join us, but she asked to, to be presented with those questions and we will be happy to send her the list and she will uh, record an answer and um, tell us, uh, share with us uh, how, um, how is it um, possible to, to achieve this minimalism and all the other uh, answers that uh, you might require of her. After each talk, we have a short coffee and toilet break. So you don't have to sit in, in your seat uh, for the whole day without uh, fulfilling basic needs. And if you do not need a coffee or toilet break, I encourage you to use this time to network. On the left side of your uh, interface, you will have the, the tab for networking. And you can schedule uh, the talks with uh, various people or uh, invite them to continuous uh, conversations. Or you can join the speed networking, which will connect you to random uh, random people. I would encourage you all to also fill out your profiles, uh, which you have available under your avatar icon in the top right corner of your screen so that people that you talk to will have better idea of who you are and where you come from. After the event, at the end of the event, uh, we will also publish a short poll to uh, find out which presentation or talk uh, did you find the best. And uh, it would be very helpful if we could share this information with the, the speaker. I think they will be very happy to learn that there was uh, best uh, received by the community. And uh, probably tomorrow uh, we'll be sending an email to, to all of you with some more question about open feedback. Unfortunately, our platform does not allow to ask you open-ended questions. Then we have to do it per mail. Uh, and if you decide to share your mailing address with us, uh, we will be able to send back to you some small tokens of appreciations uh, I know we have prepared some stickers and lanyards for you with the uh, Robocon branding. From other topics, uh, we have been talking and planning. It's not yet settled, but um, this is an open question if we uh, will organize a meetup around the Robocon online, which take place at the break of February and March. So. If you would be interested in meeting in person in Wrocław, then please let us know. Uh, we will consider it and discuss uh, also with the Robot Framework Foundation how uh, we can facilitate this event. And uh, last but not least, um, the Robocon 2023 is not off the table yet. So uh, I personally would love, love like this event to be recurring and that we actually build the community for a long time. But uh, frankly, we are not able to do it alone. We will need your help and support. And uh, if you are able to uh, join the organization committee, committee or share some ideas, how would we um, make the event better or would you would like to present something, uh, please consider letting us know and uh, joining us in the organization efforts for next year. Um, where can you find us if you uh, didn't already know? Um, basically, uh, we have a web page at Robocon.eu. Also, there is a LinkedIn profile and Facebook page, which we will be transforming to groups so that you also can post to those groups and not just comment on the uh, posts and events. Uh, as I mentioned, the whole goal of the event is to build a community and you are the community. And um, as the last uh, and probably most important part, I would uh, like to invite you all to uh, join the official Robot Framework uh, Slack channel. And in there, you can find us in the uh, channel hashtag Robocon. So uh, some of the people organizing the event are already there and uh, hopefully we'll see you there as well. Okay, that's uh, 
it from my side, from the talking points. I would propose two minutes and in exactly two minutes, we'll start with the presentation from Mika Solmela. Thank you, have fun, and uh, hopefully you'll stick with us to the end of the day. Bye. Absolutely fantastic to be here. So first of all, big thank you to Nice Project and uh, Fropacon team to organizing this conference. My name is Mika Solmela. I'm the executive director of the Robot Framework Foundation. And if you're not familiar with Robot Framework, it is a general open source tool used for automation, uh, for RPA test automation, just in general automation. This talk, however, is about the Robot Framework Foundation. You might ask, what is that? The foundation is the enabler of the Robot Framework tool. And Robot Framework tool is maintained, developed, supported by the Robot Framework Foundation. So that is the most sim uh, single important thing to remember. So you might be familiar with the Robot Framework tool, but maybe not the foundation. So let's find out more about that. So to the prehistory. Oh, damn it. Not that far. I meant just to the history of Robot Framework Foundation. Uh, so the tool uh, was initially developed to uh, Nokia back in 2004. Uh, as a master thesis by Pekka Clark, the main developer back then and still. So Pekka has been around for a long time. Uh, Nokia decided to drop the support for the tool 2014-15. However, they were gracious enough to let us open source it and the uh, license was given to uh, newly established Robot Framework Foundation. Initially, there were seven companies uh, fun, uh, funding and, and founding the Robot Framework Foundation. The idea was from Ismo Ara, the former chairman of the board. Uh, if you are not familiar with the foundation uh, today, it's a bit different than it was what it was. So we have grown a lot. So we have 54 companies from eight different countries ranging from one man or one person shops to multi-billion dollar companies. So there are really diverse group of members. However, the foundation is a, a democracy. So each member has one vote intent. And, and by kind of law, we are a legal entity in Finland. Uh, so we are a Finnish association and we are governed by the Finnish laws and we have an articles of association to follow and, and so forth. So it is an entity to support and maintain and develop the tool. Besides that, there are many different ecosystem projects. If you are not familiar with the Robot Framework ecosystem, uh, it can be said that there's Robot Framework Core, which is the main thing 
the thing that everything else around goes. So you could say that if we are talking about planets, it's the sun. So everything else is kind of s around it. So, so the ecosystem, we have there are a lot of libraries, uh, different tools, APIs, and, and so forth. So it is something to support robot framework. That robot framework can be used more widely. There are more functionalities and features and, and so forth. So so it is a whole whole lot of love from the, from the ecosystem for the core. And our main purpose is to develop, maintain the core. But of course, if we have money, we are happy to fund also the ecosystem projects. Uh, by the way, as an open source project, uh, o project the ecosystem projects are usually done by the people of the community. So anybody can do them and, and any but I can get funding if we have money. So if you have nice ideas uh, and we have funding, let's discuss. Uh, the community is the other thing that uh, we maintain. Uh, so we have Slack, we have forum. Uh, Slack you are probably familiar with, so it's uh, quick messages and, and so forth. For a forum, it's uh, kind of based on Discord, so you can have the history there, you can find questions that somebody else has asked before, you can find the answers, so it's great. We also have email list, which is not super active, but um, if that's your preferred choice, use it. We have also the monthly open space. It is the last Friday of every month. Usually there is some pre-taught topic, uh, after there is a QA and a and a free discussion about anything related to robot framework and sometimes not related to robot framework, usually somewhat related still. And, and the monthly open space is something that if you have a project or uh, you have done something or, or you are thinking about doing something with robot framework, you can also drop by to ask questions or, or suggest ideas and, and so forth. So it's a great place to meet people besides the kind of Slack and forum to discuss. One of our biggest promises as Robot Framework Foundation is to keep the tool free, relevant, and open source. And that is the main thing that, that we promise. So if you think about some proprietary tools, there is usually a cost of a license or, or some other means, to, they will get your money. But uh, as an open source, you can use our tool freely. And well, it's a bit hard to say how many people actually, but let's say thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands use our tool. So it is a great thing to have out there and we are really happy to support it. Of course, the foundation is not that widely known as a tool. So one of our agenda is also to spread the word about the foundation, because in the end, the foundation is the NLA player that kind of takes this responsibility to hand out this great tool to everybody. Moving forward, so a bit about how we operate. Uh, the foundation, uh, so we need funding. So we have members who pay an annual membership fee Moreover, we organize Robocon, which we get some ticket revenue. Uh, there is also a new possibility for uh, private individuals to join uh, the foundation next year. So you could just kind of join as a support member and, and give a hundred or wh whatever you, you see fit to give us. So that's also a nice opportunity. Uh, with the money, so we are non-profit, so we don't take anything per se, but we use it all to advance our purpose. A uh, bit more about the operations, so in practice, the foundation members or the association members, as we are by law an association, uh, they have the main saying, we form an annual plan beginning of the year, which we follow and then the board and me as executive director and work groups uh, work on to execute the annual plan. Uh, sometimes we do better, sometimes worse, but of course it's a, it's a plan, things happen, we, we do our very best. We rely heavily on uh, active people from the community. The board uh, also 
gives a lot of their time, but we are open source community, so we can of course plan things, but in the end, it's also about the people to execute. Me as one person, executive director, there is only one, so much I can do, but still always doing my best to support, support uh, the foundation and the community. Uh, if we think about uh, work groups, you're welcome to join, even if you are not the foundation member. So this year, for example, we have had a style guide work group working on the best practices or, or style, how, how you should do robot framework, what is the kind of best way to implement stuff, what is the prettiest way, what is the recommended way. And that work is still ongoing. We have also had another work group working on the documentation or actually getting started material. So the documentation itself is a bit different thing, but besides the documentation, we have been lacking a good get started material. And that's, that's what we have been doing uh, this year. Uh, there are multiple other work groups that have been working on, on many different agendas. And next year we'll be having, again, some of the work groups will continue. Some will be new. Uh, one will be a diversity work group, for example, which we will launch and many more. Let's, let's see. If you're interested uh, contributing your time, let me know. Then, of course, we support the community. More about that uh, now. So robotframework.org slash uh, hash community. You can find our Slack. Uh, you can find our forum there, um, our social media channels as well, but mainly those two. If you are not yet in the Slack, I recommend you join. So you can have open discussions there. Uh, you can get and give help. What I mean by that is if you have any issues, you have problems, quite often it can be that people working with testing or, or automation, they work in a smaller team, it's in a mid-sized company or smaller smallish company. So they don't necessarily have a big team to support them. So they can ask questions on our Slack channel to get help to advance their project, or of course, if you have some personal projects that you would like to have some help with, that's a great place to ask. The forum is course is great as well. You can find the history there, you can search for certain topics. In Slack, I recommend you use the dedicated channels. So most of the libraries have a dedicated channel and so forth. So search for a specific channel. If you can find one, you can post your questions on general. That's always an option. And it can be that somebody asks you to direct your question to an other channel. And what I mean by giving help is that we hope that you can always answer questions if you know to answer. So it's a two way street in many ways. We, we need active people in the community to also give back in, in multiple forms. And one of the forms is contributing your knowledge to advance the community as a whole. Overall, I, I think we are one of the most uh, friendliest and politest community there is out there. And of course, we want to keep it that way. So be polite, be friendly. And moreover, one of the main benefits of this kind of an open source community is the innovative and adaptive touch. So, so what I mean by this is that once there is something happening in the market, usually our community starts brewing the solution. If there is a bigger change, for example, 2019, we the, uh, Playwright came to the market and, and soon enough uh, there was a discussion. Should we still use Selenium? What should we do? And basically, quite quickly, uh, some of the bright minds from the community came up with the browser library, which is still maintained uh, today. and, and it, very actively used. So this kind of a group of people gathers the best from the field to a common topic, advance it together. And, and that is a very much the power of our community. Of course, these people work in uh, separate companies and, and they can advance their agenda there. 
but when there is something in the market or or overall you have a great idea that you would like to uh, do you can find like-minded people uh, with different capabilities or, or similar capabilities depending on what you need I guess from our community and and usually there are really good discussions and conversations around where should we go next and and what is the kind of next big thing and and uh, of course it divides people but in the end there are many good solutions so depending on the problem there can be multiple solutions anyway the security is one of the things that we get as an open source project through our community so all of these bright minds can check what is going on with the code uh, it's not closed it's as open as it gets so if you want to contribute you can your code will be reviewed uh, by everybody or at least whoever is interested uh, of course the core team also checks the code if you make a pull request but in a way the principle is that more eyes are better than fewer eyes and and there's a lot of truth to that the community is really the key to our success the tool itself is very good but the community is what makes it great so how to join the join or contribute so now we are talking about joining the foundation for example so we appreciate if your company can join the foundation if not uh, you could contribute at least starting next year yourself uh, something if you wish you can also join Robocon uh, to get some ticket revenue and also to meet community members we have Robocon in Helsinki 19th to 20th of January so please join we also have workshops uh, 17th and sprints 18th so it's kind of a whole week of activities with the community bringing everybody together in Helsinki uh, it's full in-person event and six weeks later uh, 28th of February we have the online conference or it's three days but anyway starting 28th of February and we'll have some fresh content like 50% maybe and the talks are recorded from the on-site conference and there is a live Q&A also uh, present in the online conference the platform is Catertown which is pretty nice it's like game like uh, platform so so you can meet people you can have chats you can have video calls and, and you can move around and it's it's a it's gonna be a great conference for the online and for the on site so please join one of them it, it will be good and other ways to contribute is you can always contribute your time so like I said in the work groups for example but you can also do pull requests on the core or take a system projects you can do issues you can suggest new stuff new fresh changes we are we are always kind of uh, listening what's going on in the field what, what is going on in the community what is the general sentiment we are quite soon next year also launching this community survey so please transfer that we'll get valuable feedback on what's going on where where are we going where should we be going what are the next critical features on the track so basically the community surveys is kind of linked also to the development and the development work group so so the development work group is the one responsible for the roadmap of the robot framework core so the development work group will definitely be checking the survey results as well and and it's a kind of a way for you to give back answering that survey and letting us know where to steer where where to go with our roadmap where to take our tool which direction so very crucial to get that information then of course like mentioned slack forum great ways to contribute is to answer questions and, and being active there if you have something else in mind you'd like to contribute let me know we are always open to suggestions you can always of course just be yourself and do it your way so now that you got interested interested uh, you can contact me uh, in slack for example uh, or via email uh, executive director at robotframework.org or 
Slack, my name is so Mika Solmela. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be available after this recording or then via the channels mentioned. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm really helpful uh, in multiple ways, so just reach out and uh, I'll try my best to help you. Help you. And I'm, I'm also really grateful for having been here. So thank you, nice project. Uh, have a great conference, everybody. See you soon. So please welcome on stage Mika Selmala in person. Uh, Mika, thank you for uh, for your presentation and for your support during organization of the whole conference. Uh, you are probably muted because uh, I see the icon now. Yes, perfect. Now, okay. now you should now hear we can me. hear you. <laughs> Classic. Great. Um, we have uh, some uh, questions from from the crowd, and. Oh, perfect. Uh, the most important question, the, the most upvoted one, is to uh, how to find some information about the work groups and uh, ways mm. to getting involved in those work groups. That is a really good question. So, like, like said in in the talk, we we are organized in in a way that we have a board, and usually the board forms the work groups among the major topics that we have. So, like said, next year we we are now with the board crafting the current action plan and, and the association or the foundation members will kind of approve it. And, and next year we'll form, the, so early next year, January, February, we'll form the work groups. So we will definitely be posting uh, about those in our uh, Slack. So for example, if you follow uh, our Slack and channel channel, so early next year, I will be looking for volunteers for those work groups. So if you want to contribute your time um, and you see a topic that you either want to learn more, you know something, or, or just kind of, well, this could be something that is interesting, then please ping me then and, and we get it from there. Okay. The second question um, is, how are the companies involved in developing and supporting robot framework? Well, that also depends a lot, because like I said, we, we have many members and, and some are really active, they are, also developing the core kind of internally sometimes so they might have some projects that they add a feature to the core and, and this can be discussed and uh, and agreed with the foundation and and it can happen or it can be that a company is just happy as they are they just want us to maintain they want us to kind of do our thing just just do it and here's the money please <laughs> keep it going so so there are really like both ends and everything in between. I would say most companies are more on the passive side, meaning that they are kind of relying on us to do our work and, and they are just happy to, to be part of it. But like I said, depends on the company. Okay. Uh, third question. Uh, will the individual members of the foundation, will they have the same voting rights are as the companies? And uh, no, so so the individuals will be support members, meaning it will be a monetary support mainly. And, and of course you can, as of now already, attend all the uh, board meetings. So, so they are open to the community. So if you want to know more what we are doing, how we operate, you are welcome to join. Uh, basically, or, or all the members can join uh, for the community, uh, I think we haven't really opened them, but we can discuss. But if you join as a uh, support member, you, you can join and also see kind of what's happening. Basically, the support membership is brand new thing. And also companies could do it. Uh, so it depends. If you are a little, really like a company that is using a robot framework, we would prefer to have an active uh, company joining. So, so kind of join as a full member and really get involved. But but of course, if you're just saying like, shut up and take our money, then, <laughs> then we take That's your money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and last question. What activities are planned around the Robocon conference next year? Mm. So so uh, like, like I said, we, we have first the Helsinki Robocon uh, in, in January and 
here we have in kind of official activities would be the conference days. So, so that would be Friday, Thursday. Then uh, there is uh, usually the active dinner in the first night. It's kind of mostly for the speakers and the workshop organizers and core team, but there will be some spots available for the uh, participants. So it will be soon out for everybody, I think next week. Uh, so okay. if you are fast, you could join the kind of speaker slash active dinner on Thursday. Uh, Wednesday, there is the uh, sprints or, uh, well, w I think we just rebranded re it that, uh, I think we call it now, what was it again? No, open space. So so it's it's kind of like a concept that people can the whole day be there, they can present topics, they can form work groups around a certain topic. Also from the work groups the day before, uh, workshops the day before, people can kind of within the same group of people, uh, hands on, learn more about the topic that just last uh, day had the workshop on. So, so it will be a really kind of like, uh, if you have something you want to present, you want to talk, you want to discuss, let's do it. So, so the community coding day is a really, uh, sorry, uh, community open space is a really kind of a concept that has been working and, and we have really put a lot of thought to it this year and, and try to make it a bit more uh, open, even more open in a, say, in a sense that, it, that anything can happen. Of course, related to robot framework. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there, there are the workshops, so that's Tuesday. So that's kind of the opening for the uh, whole whole conference in Helsinki. And then we have the online conference on... Uh, actually, it switch now. Uh, we just uh, yesterday agreed that we'll have it from Wednesday, so 1st of March till Friday uh, 3rd. So, so we changed the date. Uh, so that's also new information. And there will be also a community day there on Friday. Okay. Thank you very much, Mika, and uh, mainly for joining us and uh, telling us about the foundation. And we have now uh, scheduled a short break. We'll see us in five minutes at 9.45 uh, with the talk from Lina Zubita. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.
Hi everyone, welcome to my talk, How Minimalism Helps Build High Quality Products. My name is Luna Zubite. I like to call myself Quality Aficionado, even though my current title is Head of Quality at Doodle. You can find me on Twitter as Bagilina. I do like to write on quality topics a lot, and my writings are on qualitybits.tech. And I do have a podcast too uh, with the same name, Quality Bits. So check it out and feel free to reach out to me with any questions, comments, discussions. So let's get back to this topic minimalism and high quality products. Why would I even link those? Well, I was reading a lot about minimalism and it's funny, but I saw so many parallels when it comes to high quality products based on all the experience I've had working with software engineering. So I thought I will add all those parallels in this talk and tell you more about what I've observed and what I find really useful uh, concepts for building high quality products and they do relate with minimalism quite a bit so let's set the stage first where did i get this idea i was at a conference a testing conference and if you've been at a testing conference you know that there are talks about tools I know that as well, right? And I go on a talk and don't get me wrong, some talks about tools are wonderful, they're very interesting, lots of great tips and tricks. But the talk I was in, it was just saying, this tool, that tool, these tools, this framework, that framework, oh, as if it's going to solve everything in your world. It was preaching all kinds of tools, and I was sitting there and cringing. I was like, ah, oh, I don't think that, you know, this will actually solve all the problems. And I almost fell asleep in that talk. It was so boring. Tools are great, but like, what are we even trying to solve there? Tools are not going to magically solve all your problems. It's just tools, right? In the end, it is people who solve the problems, not the tools. So we use tools to solve the problems. And here there's a funny quote as well in minimalism, um, which says, love people use things the opposite never works and i feel like here we could also say 
love people, use tools. And the opposite also never works. So you may enjoy some tools, but in the end, it's people who solve the problems. There was also the case that I saw a company where there were 100 employees and there were 120 tools. That means that actually, even if they had some common lawyers in the company, when it comes to employees, you could say that every employee introduced a new tool. And you may ask me here, so there's so many tools. Everything must be sorted out and in order with no problems. You know, maybe everything is automated and there's like a very smooth process, whatever you do, and you can get answers very easily because you're paying for so many tools. Mm, the answer is nope. There were plenty of problems. Those tools, well, they not only did not like solve the problems, but they also created multiple problems because sometimes you would try to find an answer in a tool and then you realize that it just partially answers. It does not give the full answer to whatever you were looking for. Then you have to use three other tools to combine the full answer and you are lost in noise and you have no clue which one to use because there's so many options. So this is actually overwhelming. It's not really helpful. And I keep on thinking in situations like this of Agile Manifesto. And you may say, Lena, really? This woo-woo thing, this Agile thing? I know, Agile has become a little bit abused, let's say so, because many companies do it wrong and they forget that there was just this mindset behind it. So this Agile Manifesto was created like a reminder for us how we should work. And it says that we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan, that is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. This means that even though tools are great, right? But maybe we value other things more. And even though we do enjoy documentation, but we do want that our software would work. I come back to this manifesto time and time again, because I feel that this is the crucial core idea of Agile and whatever process you end up using or tool, that's not what Agile may be. It's just a way to use something or do something, but it's not changing the interactions or customer collaboration and responding to change. It's not doing it for you. You're still doing it yourself. And one particular point here is individuals and interactions over processes and tools that's how i started the talk right the tools the processes what if we actually concentrate on the individuals and interactions first before we go to use tools digging deeper into agile manifesto i also found agile principles behind the manifesto and there was one that also stuck with me simplicity the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. As someone who has read about minimalism, simplicity, essential. Hmm. The word started getting to me. And this principle is basically meaning that we would eliminate waste, that we would do less. Actually, we would not do crazy amounts of work at the same time. And then in the end, we will do more. So less is more. Funny, right? This adds up to the concept of minimalism. So you may also say, OK, Elena, this all sounds great, but how do we do it? And we have certain teams and companies and contexts. And yeah, this is great woo-woo thing. Well, 
let's take a look at it. So first of all, let's start with the idea of minimalism, right? So we still need to get through the definition. Minimalism is intentionally promoting the things we most value and removing everything that distracts us from it. It is marked by clarity, purpose, and intentionality. I really like clarity, purpose, and intentionality. And we'll take a look how it could link with our work as well. There's one lady that uh, gets very much um, associated with minimalism. That's Marie Kondo. Marie Kondo is known for decluttering ideas and her work in also Netflix's um, show Tidying Up. And she released a book uh, where she added all these ideas. She basically says, if you pick up a thing and that thing is not sparking you joy, you should let it go, right? You should uh, actually not have it. So you should have things in your life only that are sparking you joy. You may say, ah, come on, like there are still essential things. Yeah, there are still essential things. So those you will have and you will keep with them. So don't think that minimalism is about getting away from everything. No, it's okay. Like you can have your essentials. You don't have to have bare minimum. If it adds you some kind of comfort, even if it's not sparking joy, it's like it's essential, right? So let's not mix it up. But Marie Kondo does have lots of great ideas. I saw this quote and I really liked it. So it says, when we really delve into the reasons for why we can't let something go, there are only two, an attachment to the past or a fear for the future. I really see the parallel here to software development. If you've heard of the concept sunk cost fallacy, it's basically our tendency to not let go of things where we invested a lot. So it's our attachment to the past. If we put so much work into something, we're less likely to let it go. And the fear for the future is also another thing that makes us delve into reasons why we can't let go in software development too. We may say, actually, this may happen. And then that affects the way you feel about the product and you may act accordingly. So these concepts sound like something we could use in software development, right? So minimalism, simplicity, intentional work, I believe they actually are the base of teams building high quality products. And why do I believe that? Because if you look at the definition, couldn't we just replace minimalism? with high quality products, because high quality products are actually something that are intentionally promoting the things we most value and removing everything that distracts us from it. It is marked by clarity, purpose, and intentionality, right? So our products are marked by clarity, purpose, and intentionality, but you could also say the ways of work, the way we are doing and creating those high quality products, they're also, uh, a lot of things that we could learn here. So we would want to have work that's efficient and we remove the bottlenecks. So we remove everything that distracts us from it. This is a really nice analogy. So let's dig deeper. Right? So how do we actually do this and where could we uh, find some uh, lessons from minimalism that we could apply. So I'll share some stories from about these known topics for us close to engineering, as well as some tips on where I think some minimalism lessons come in and what we could do. So when we talk about ways of work, very often what we hear is Jira. Jira is how we work, right? So, ah. Uh, I do like Jira, don't get me wrong. But the way that some people think that way of work is Jira, eh, it's not really, right? It's just a tool that helps you out. So when I Google Jira, I find these articles. So this is just one of the articles that I found. Uh, no credits given here, not to um, mock anyone. But this title makes me cringe so much. 
a guide to, to your workflow best practices with examples. And there's this huge spaghetti kind of graph, which already gives me a headache. Oh, and best practices. In one of the quality best episodes, I spoke to Steve Upton and we were talking how best practice is actually a harmful uh, phrase because sure, there are good practices, but if it works in your context, that's up to you to decide, right? So there's no best practice. There's no silver bullet that works for everyone. And here it's also as if, you know, it would help you work with each other. Nah. And come to think of it, I remember this funny example, how once uh, there was an idea in the company I worked at to introduce flags flags in jira so when you are blocked on something you would just flag something that was such a solution right so people were saying hey we're getting blocked and the the person that was uh, working a lot with these jira workflows and who had lots of experience there was like oh no problem so if you're blocked on something that's just add the flag you know and then it will raise awareness and then everyone will know and we will sort out the problem and that's what we would do. So if I'm blocked on something, I would add, okay, I'm blocked here and I'm blocked because this team needs to develop something before I do that. And after a little bit, we realized that, so what? We're marking things with flags and nothing's really changing. The same problems are still there. And one of my colleagues had a very funny quote. He said, well, you can tag it with every flag in the world and it still won't help. I laughed at it, but it was a little bit of a laugh with the tears uh, in my eye because um, it was so true. It wasn't the flag that was solving anything. It was actually the fact that we had to talk to each other that would have helped. So in these situations, let's ask ourselves, what is the purpose of whatever tool we have? And whatever we're deciding to do, are we actually intentional and clear with it? When it comes to tools and these ways of work, you know, like if you look at the actual, just like the starts of collaboration, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So Jira is just a tool, right? But what is behind it is all this collaboration. It's individuals and interactions. And I recently saw this tweet. Wait, you all don't use user stories? No, what for? To have stories. How do you break stuff down? The team meets, talks about it, maybe sketches, and then we build it. Without stories? You might take notes or diagrams and make them stories? No, no stories. And this tweet is by someone pretty known in product field. And you may think, well, shouldn't they be promoting user stories? And, you know, I do love user stories myself. And I feel like crisp, nice, short user stories are amazing. And then can, they can make us build really great products. However, if the team is fine to work without a user story, no problem. That works for them, right? This is their way of work. They talk about it, they sketch it out, and then they build it. Great. But we're sometimes so stuck with our status quo and whatever we have that we're not questioning things. And we like even answer to have stories. What for? To have stories. What kind of argument is that? And when I think, okay, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, it makes me remember the team I worked in. And this is an actual picture from that team. At the start, we didn't have Jira. We had no access to anything. We were just starting to build everything. And we just had a room. And we had lots of post-its. And we had lots of boards. And we would brainstorm everything. And it was evolving. So we just started with a few columns, a few uh, tasks, and then we just grew. In this picture, you can see the board behind. Um, that was our actual development board. Whatever was uh, ready to pick up or like it was in development. And you even could see avatars on some of the stories. So this was all a physical board. And the team had an actual stand up. So every day, the team would meet up and they would go around the board and they would give their updates. 
And here you may say, yeah, this was before pandemic. Yeah, it was before pandemic, but I feel like there's a lot here to learn from this because you don't really need a special specific tool to do something. You still can do the work. It looks just different and whatever works for this team. So here also you can see that there's a laptop open and I, I, as far as I remember, there was someone online. So we actually were doing like a hybrid meeting. So they were being involved and we were sketching and using whiteboards to decide on a new solution. So you don't necessarily need a certain specific tool. What matters for VESO work are individuals and interaction. So instead of using lots of flags in JIRA, if you could just go to that team and say, hey, what's up? Um, are you going to work on this? If you're not going to work on this, when are you planning to work on this? That's it. Talk to each other. Next step engineering simplicity there was a simplicity principle right so let's dig in here there's one thing that we often see over engineering and you may think hey you're head of quality don't you think that we should build like amazing perfect quality i don't believe in perfect i don't believe in best I believe in good based on the context and I believe in context and um, I would answer very often, it depends. Um, it doesn't mean that you're doing something completely um, basic and without anything and we'll get into this. But there are some concepts in engineering simplicity that can help us a lot. And there's this quote that I really like by Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, who said, if you are not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you have launched it too late. So we all may have seen Big Bang releases with lots of features and lots of things going on. Maybe that not necessarily was a great thing. Maybe we should just have given it to users and for them to give feedback to us. An example of this, as a Microsoft brand. I don't know if you are aware of this product, but it was released in 2014 and it was pretty fascinating and full of features, Microsoft brand. It was like a fitness watch as we have, right? So I have Apple Watch now, but this one, it not only had all the fitness tracking functions, not only you could access apps, you could even have a microphone there. It was so full of features. But in a sense, it had a bit too many features. And also the price of it was a lot for people who have never used it. And there were other competitors in the market that had better options. So this was discontinued and it flopped lots of engineering efforts maybe just hypothesis but maybe if they release with less features they could have gotten some feedback and realized what people need and improved on it instead of just building it and then flopping joshua karevsky is about to release a book joy of agility and there he states this mantra start minimal and evolve I really like this mantra because I feel like it touches on minimalism as well of, of how to build high uh, quality products. And there's also one concept in evolutionary design. Uh, so evolutionary design states that it's the practice of growing a system in a natural way by adding the minimum amount of code to satisfy the business needs in an iterative and incremental approach. This is very similar to MVPs, right? To a minimal viable product. And very often I see companies that they do not really know how to build MVPs. Very often MVPs are huge. They're, they're, I don't know, they're Microsoft bands. And here is a big challenge also, like how to have enough of trade-offs, right? How to balance out the quality and what we have and have certain needs there. And I'd like to introduce to you this concept of desire paths. I really like this example. So basically, um, in architecture, there was this case where they built a campus. This is not the exact campus. This is Brazilian Brazil, by the way. Uh, but they built the campus for university. 
and the architect did not add the pathways in the campus and some people were like oh why aren't you adding you know you could just have a pavement like for pedestrians to walk some paths and the architect said yeah but i'm actually not adding it on purpose i want my users to tell me where are they going to walk and once they actually step into this grass and they make the pathways this is where i'm going to lay down uh, little pathways and uh, make pavements and i feel like that is a great concept right so they call this desire paths and in tech we also could learn from it so we could first release the product collect lots of data understand what our users want and see how they behave actually make some kind of decisions for our next steps when we actually release the first part of the thing not only releasing the big bang uh, product a book that i really would like to recommend you is building evolutionary architectures by neil ford rebecca parsons and patrick Qua. Uh, it's actually a fascinating concept i didn't think that i would be so into architectures as, as a qa but i am because it's talking exactly about this that we have to build architecture which evolves and for this we also have to have fitness functions or something that manually or automatically gives us some kind of feedback on how we're doing in our architecture so it still doesn't mean that we're just blindly building something and a little thing but we also have some quality checks right so it's about this trade-off and balance right that we are balancing this out and making sure that we can grow our product and have an evolution with it Another concept I'd like to share with you is this uh, German word that I'm going to butcher now, which is Datensparsamkeit. Um, there's an article by Martin Fowler with the same name uh, where he uh, explains this concept in more detail. But it's about the fact that if you are building some system, it chooses lots of data, don't use and take all the data you can get. There's this misconception that you know we should take all the data we can get and store it because who knows maybe you will need it but with a lot of data comes lots of responsibility so i'd say don't need it don't store it because if there's a data breach or something then you will be one more source that could be actually attacked right so you could be actually causing privacy problems and security problems What's more, you're causing more problems for yourself because you're creating noise. So you're not having only essential data, you're having so much more. So it's hard for you to find whatever you need as well there. So if you don't need it, don't store it. An example here I would have is that once we worked in a team where we were just sending out an email about a confirmation of the purchase. In that email, we had to add the four last digits of IBAN, so we'll have a payment account. So if a customer made a purchase, we would say, okay, we charge your account, and then there will be XXXXX, and then there would be last four digits so the person knows where they were charged. The challenge here is that the provider at the start actually wanted to send us the full IBAN. And if we did not question it, we would have stored the full IBAN and there would be two sources in the company, two teams that would be prone to risk of data breach attacks, right? So if someone stole our data, they would get all the IBANs, which is private information. So what we did, instead of just storing it and then thinking, okay, how do we secure it? We actually asked the provider team, hey, you know, we don't really need a full IBAN. Could we just get the last four digits? They were like, fine, sure, no problem. And in this way, we avoided storing what we don't need. So we store only what we need. And then it was easier for us when it comes to privacy and security, um, as well as you know not causing any problems there. So don't get overwhelmed with data because that can be really noisy for you. So don't store what you don't need. I have to talk about safety nets because when we discuss about you know shipping the MVP, shipping fast, you may think, okay, what about quality? And 
yeah, I love quality products, right? And high quality products. And they think, come on, like, will it be high quality product? Well, uh, there is this quote also that says, it's better to build the right thing wrong than to build the wrong thing right. So we did tackle this part, right? So evolutionary design, evolutionary architecture, great. So we can work on it. But it doesn't mean that we're working without any safety net. So we want to make sure that we fail fast wisely. And how can we do it? Well, one literal example is from real life, right? So when the Golden Gate Bridge, the iconic red bridge that you see in San Francisco pictures was being built, it was an enormous structure. The years were great depression years in the US, so people wanted to get work, but it also was a really scary project. Because if you fell from that bridge, you would die. And in order for this project to successfully continue and provide safety to the workers, the project's lead did invest a lot of money to create the safety net. So if someone slipped and fell, they would be caught. And I love this idea. Sure, it was extra investment, but it wasn't as huge of investment and it provided security for the people working there. And I feel like there are investments that we can do as well, building high quality products and building right products, even though it's not perfect implementation, we do need safety measures. And that is automation tests. We have to have automation tests. If we don't have it, how will we know if we fail? We need to have a proper feedback loop there. And some tips here that I have that for you to try, and maybe it doesn't make sense, so take it with a pinch of salt. Test-driven development, big fan. Why? Because you're developing and you're writing tests. You write the test first, you see it fail, right? Because you're, you're not, you haven't implemented yet the functionality. And then when you do implement, you see, okay, the test is passing. So you have both things. You have the functionality, plus you have the test. You already have feedback for you. So when you work on something else, if something breaks, you will get feedback. Another thing is balancing your test based on your context. And also we say 80-20 rule that I hate these test coverage metrics that is 100% because you can really rig it. You can test functionality instead of testing your, um, you can test them in your function, right? You could test the implementation detail, but that's not the good test. What you should be testing is actually the behavior, right? What you expect it to do. So it shouldn't be tightly coupled with your implementation detail. It should be a little bit detached. So even if you change the code, the test is still okay. And balancing your tests means that you shouldn't have just one type of test. So it shouldn't be just entry tests or unit tests. It should be a balanced level. So if it makes more sense for you to have more integration tests, great, have some integration tests. But unit tests are the cheapest. So always have it in mind what's the cheapest, fastest, most effective feedback that you can have and balance it out because end-to-end -end journeys are great, but they are very expensive. And maybe you could even have no engine tests. I've seen teams like this because they could cover all their testing in lower levels, like contract tests, integration tests, or unit tests. And if these two sound like too much of a fantasy level, and you may say, oh, we don't really do it in our company. We haven't started from scratch. I get you. It's, it's hard to start there. But there's one simple rule that you could start enforcing. Fix a bug, write a test. Bugs are symptoms of a failed system. You don't want it to happen again. So create a test. And then you will have feedback. If it happens again, you will have the test. And this is you building your safety net. Now, understanding the problem. This is the essential part of whatever work we do in the software engineering field. Before we search for the solutions or say, oh, this tool will solve everything, let's understand what we're trying to solve, right? What is the actual problem? I really liked how in one quality bits episode, Nadine Oldorf has said, get the problem to the bare bones. We were talking about user stories. We were talking about how to actually make a very nice crisp user story. 
And she said, yeah, get it to the bare bones, to the basics, the simplest thing you can get. And then you can work from there, right? So once you have the little, little pieces, step by step, you will manage. And this comic, I just had to include because I find it very funny. It all makes sense, especially when I was recently at the talk where an agile coach was telling the story how in many companies, people don't really know why they're going agile. And they asked the people there and they were like, hey, why are you trying to go agile? And the people said, oh, I don't know, my manager told me to go agile. I go to the manager, they're like, okay, why, are you, why do you want to turn agile? Well, you know, um, apart from giving those, you know, um, actual school book reasons that, oh, we want to be agile, we want to be effective, da, da, da. Like when you dig deeper and you're like, okay, but why exactly you want to be agile? They're like, yeah, our CEO told us to become agile. And then they asked that CEO, right? Why do you want to be agile? And it turns out the real story was that they went to some golf court, they met another CEO, they spoke together and they said, oh, you know, the great thing happened. We went agile. Oh, agile. Hmm, I should try as well. <laughs> That's how a lot of companies go agile. That's why it, there's such a curse word everywhere because we are abusing it. We don't understand what it is, right? And uh, yeah because competitors do so so often when we are trying to solve something let's ask what's the actual problem reason right maybe we're solving the wrong thing and use tools only when you properly properly understand the problem and then you will be speeding up right so don't just add many tools and hope that you will be faster no they actually can make you slower because you may not know what you're exactly uh, tackling so understanding the problem and your use case you will be able to understand what do you need for that as well i'd like to suggest you one technique it's called five whys and um, give you an example of how you could use it so always question the status quo question whatever situation you have and i feel like as a qa you often say i'm a question asker as well because i ask many questions to understand this root cause of things so Imagine CEO wrote to you and they're saying, oh, let's get the shiny new entry and automation tool. It could help. No, you ask why did this come up? Well, we have had many issues in production due to bugs. Okay, makes sense. But why did we have issues? Well, we had no tests to provide safety feedback. So everything kept on breaking and we kept on rushing. So makes sense, right? If we have entry and automation tool, we would get feedback. But here I would not stop because I'd say, okay, no tests to provide safety. Everything kept on breaking. We kept on rushing. That's a lot to unload here. So I would dig in deeper. Why? We wanted to deliver features, but also had many reappearing bugs to fix interesting reappearing bugs why did you have reappearing bugs i said well we had no test to tell about bugs we don't have test automation even unit tests we felt like there's no time for that huh it's really interesting so we're talking here about end-to-end -end automation tool but we are learning that the team doesn't even have unit tests properly set up we also see that they didn't have time for that so how are they going to get time to look at whatever end-to-end -end automation tool generates as well and then we can also dig deeper okay like why was that and then we felt pressure from management Oof. so here we're actually uncovering lots of systematic problems the pressure the psychological safety the feeling that there's no room for failure or there's no room as well for tests because we're so hurrying and then when it comes to tests we don't even have unit tests so looking at this situation what i would advise absolutely not getting this tool because we don't have time to take a look at this tool right and we have bigger problems we should actually collect all those items and work on it right so if you don't have unit tests, whew, those are much cheaper and more effective and faster tests so let's have those instead of this ancient automation tool we don't know how to write them 
let's get a workshop. Let's work on the problems that we have. And don't get me wrong. Tools are not bad. I love tools. They help us. Just use them wisely to solve your problems. Don't overdo the tools because then you will end up in a huge chaos. There's this beautiful uh, little story that I've heard somewhere that Buddha arrived at a river and the people waiting there asked him to cross it by walking over the water. Buddha pointed to a boat and said, there's a simpler way. So even if Buddha had the ability to walk over the water, why would he walk over the water when there's a boat? So tools are exactly that, right? So they help us improve and do things faster and in a simpler way, but we have to be wise about it and not just, you know, um, expose all of our powers and just be like, oh, you know, this tool can do everything. Like, if you don't need to use it, don't use it, right? If you can have something simpler, just choose what's simpler, choose the simpler ways. And this is a lot about minimalism and what's essential, right? So just choosing what we actually need. And here I would like to remind you of this XKCD comic, which says, is it worth the time, right? So should you actually uh, invest in getting the tool if you know it's not saving you that much of time so if we look at this so how much time you shave off and how often you do the task so this way you can actually evaluate how much you should invest in order to automate it right so you could say okay if i write a script to do something instead of me then you know how much time i'm willing to invest so that it would pay off so if I do the task, let's say monthly, and uh, I shave off 30 seconds, then if you know I invest 30 minutes right now, I think it will pay off pretty well. Um, but then if you know it's not really paying off and I need to invest more time to automate something, it's not worth it. The same happens with tools, right? So sometimes it's just not worth it to get some extra tool, which will cause more problems for you. So always ask yourself what is needed, what simplifies your work, what makes you more efficient, and work with intentionality and clarity and purpose. So if there's one lesson I want you to remember from this talk, it's that to build high quality products, I believe that we have to make essential decisions, to have this word essential in our heads from minimalism, right? What is essential for us? With clarity, purpose, and intentionality. And there's the saying, less is more, and less is so much more. So let's remember it when we are working on building products, because sometimes having more, we generate cognitive load, and that is not helping us at all. So less is more, and that can help us so much in build more quality products. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. If you would like to reach out, go ahead. I'd love to hear from you. And I did add some resources as well that you could check out. And I hope you enjoyed this talk and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you and bye. So this was the talk from Lina. And as I mentioned, Lina will not be joining us today, unfortunately, but uh, we're still gathering some questions for her in the Q&A sessions. And you are very welcome to add your two cents and uh, ask some additional questions. Maybe you have some other feelings about uh, the situation that she described. Mm, we will forward it all to, to Lina and uh, get a video response from her as soon as possible and distribute it to all of you if you are interested. Next, we have planned a little break to get something to drink and uh, get comfortable. And we see each other at 10.35 by the talk of Krzysztof Zminkowski about robot framework and RunnerX integration. Until then.
to the very first VeroboCon. I'm very glad to be here. It's a great honor for me to have a talk at the very, very first VeroboCon. I hope there is still much more VeroboComs to come in the future and uh, hope you to see you also there. But uh, let's get back to the topic of the presentation. So I wanted to tell you a story about the integration of robot framework and RunRx, the tale of continuous research. The subtitle is about the continuous research, but there are many more levels of this story, but you will surely find, find out shortly. So lend me your ears and let the story begin. But uh, first, before we begin the story, I would like to give you a bit of background of the background in, of the industry this project the story takes place. So it is in the printing industry. So when I first heard that our customer is from the printing industry, I imagined a printer like you see here. So a regular everyday printer that you can find in the office or at home, but I couldn't be much more wrong. Uh, our customer produces a printers like these. Hmm. Actually, where is the printer here? Uh, is it this? Is this the printer? Or is this? Yeah. The printer is here on the right side. So you here see several printer printing machines and this uh, uh, machine by which uh, the person is standing is um, a control panel that allows to yeah, control the printing process. So as you can see from the first picture and from this picture, uh, I'm printing industry is quite complex. It's a, when you have all the machines that are required to print, for example, a book, uh, they can consume a lot of space. Uh, there are a lot of, lot of connections between the machines because one is printing, the other one is folding and the printed sheets, the other one is gluing them together. So, um, like I said, very complex process. And our customer not only provides the printers and all other devices that are needed to get from a PDF file to, for example, a ready-to-sell book, uh, but also the software that drives the, um, the these machines. So uh, software, for example, like we saw in the previous slide, uh, for the the control panel, but also software that manages the whole printing area and the whole process. Yeah. So, so what was the problem that you wanted to solve? A system on the test was a desktop Java application plus some uh, distributed uh, applications. And uh, what was the situation as we were introduced to that project? And our customer already invested in RunRx. So what is RunRx? It's a commercial tool. It helps to automate uh, desktop applications. So with the use of RunRx, one can create a desktop automation automated test. And yeah, RunRx provides a recorder. So uh, a tester, for example, can record the actions that he is performing on the desktop application and then by playing back this recording the actions are taken again on the application so this way this this is a way to, uh, among others to create a automate the test with RunRx. so but Although the investment in the RunRx, the return of the investment wasn't as big as expected. Mm, yeah, the thing was that there could be only one type of test performed, and that was 
end-to-end front-end test uh, with no database test, no API test, and that was due to the lack of uh, C-hash developers. Another issue was the number of available licenses because um, there was only two licenses available. Mm, Yeah, and then it was uh, challenging to share the license among, uh, among the testers. What we wanted to achieve. Um, first of all, the main issue that we thought is uh, about is the number of licenses and that uh, not every person can write a test. So uh, when he wants to write a test because, for example, the license is occupied by someone else. And the second goal is kind of combined because uh, we wanted also that non-technical uh, persons that are subject matter experts in a specific printing domain can also write uh, a test. So we wanted to be the entry threshold as low as possible as and as seamless as possible from the non-technical uh, subject matter experts because yeah sometimes convincing uh, people to new technology can be uh, hard so we wanted to be like i said as seamless as possible so we came up with a solution uh, runorex provides a dotnet api in dll files so we used iron python it's a open source implementation of python which is tightly integrated with uh, .NET. Uh, so the um, we had the link between runorex and robot framework by using iron python and also we engaged the remote library just to communicate it to the distributed environment and how does it look like on a diagram? So we have the test resources. I'll go come back to the resources in a moment. And then we had yeah, Iron Python. We had a library written in Iron Python. And the library also mm, included a remote library. And with the help of remote library using .NET runtime we mm, the, our library communicated to the runorex dll files and the runorex dll files that are containing the api um, were conducting the uh, test so they were performing the actions on the system under test yeah and it worked um, the SMEs wrote test on a confluence page. Yeah, it's maybe kind of strange and fun why on confluence page and how. So, but the idea is uh, it's, uh, very brilliant and it's simple. So it's simply brilliant solution because how did it, how did it look like? Um, uh, SME, a subject matter expert. Uh, wrote test on a confluence play page the mm, confluence page was actually a table in which the sme wrote the steps of the test and then uh, we took those html files um, downloaded them mm, with the help of a robot tidy the syntax was translated to robot framework syntax and this way we had ready to use uh, test tests uh, another part was the golang solution the golang application uh, that was um, uh, that the main responsibility of the application was to take 
care of the dependencies of the environment. So it uh, downloaded um, the Confluence pages and the, con the con conversion from HTML files to a robot file. It also checked if, um, if Iron Python is installed, if uh, every library is installed, so um, if RunRx is there also, so for all the um, dependencies. But it also had its downsides. Iron Python was old technology even back then, it was over two years ago, so uh, sunset technology is always a red flag, for example, for security concerns. And the same for Python 2.7, uh, it's also uh, old technology. And another issue was that the <coughs> described deployment of the uh, library was problematic. So. So it was time for a new solution. Around that time, uh, the developer that was involved in the uh, first solution had to move to another project. So a new developer come into play with new, fresh view on this topic. And uh, he concluded that it's uh, best to uh, approach the RunRx API from a another angle. So the core stayed the same as it was. So we wanted to stay with robot framework and we needed to go from .NET to Python. Uh, but this time we engage uh, PythonNet. It looked uh, promising and uh, seemed easy to implement. And yeah, one thing that was missing was also a framework on which we could uh, work. We decided that we will use a .NET framework and some of you may wonder what, why not .NET Core. Um, actually, because back then uh, RunRx didn't uh, support a .NET Core and also RunRx needs an environment on which it can render images. So uh, .NET uh, framework uh, fulfilled uh, this uh, pre prerequisites. So, and thanks to using Python .net, we can we could switch from Python 2.7 to Python 3. So again, on the diagram, how that is it? look like the test resources and system on the test remain as they were uh, and yeah, in the middle we can see that this uh, a bit uh, simpler diagram because we have the uh, library in python and this library now using python net which was a flexible api uh, connects to RunRx DLL files where the .NET API is stored. And again, the RunRx DLL um, is uh, taking action on the system on the test. And here is a code snippet with an example of a keyword from this uh, solution. So uh, it's a run application keyword. It has several arguments. Some of them have uh, default values. And yeah, the doc string and the main part of the, the core of the keyword is here. We are actually calling with the, by the use of uh, Python net, we are calling a function from the .NET API in RunRx that is called run application and are passing the arguments uh, to that uh, function. And based on this pattern, we mm, created some basic uh, keywords like click a button or drag and drop. And again, it worked, but creating and developing the library was quite 
complicated because yeah, like you saw on the previous slide um, all the keywords in our library were triggering a function from the .NET uh, DLL API of Ranorex so we had to import all these DLL files uh, to our library and the yeah, other thing was that the Python and .NET framework didn't want to cooperate with each other from at least the newest versions of both solutions was weren't compatible so we had to basic try and error search which python version uh, will cooperate with which dotnet framework yeah but we um, created some basic keywords for interacting with the uh, desktop application but uh, yeah as the basic keywords were, were ready our <laughs> so to say special forces uh, developer who work on it had to move to uh, another project and a new developer uh, was introduced to the project and by the time at when she was uh, uh, getting familiar with uh, this library and with uh, Ranorex as a product she stumbled on the information that uh, Ranorex is planning to uh, create a Ranorex driver so after researching the topic of Ranorex driver we decided to go for it so it was time for the solution uh, 3.0 as you can see the technology stack is far more simpler than the previous uh, solutions so we had just a robot framework and runnerx driver so maybe it's a good time to say a bit how the runnerx driver is working um, it exposes a w3c web driver interface on top of runnerx runtime and as a result a runnerx driver works with uh, tests that are written using a selenium framework so um, the one might say that runnerx driver is borrowing some of the functions uh, from selenium and makes them available for desktop applications and yeah how the, the solution look like so uh, we had a runnerx driver library as we call it and the library has uh, the web driver in it and the web driver from the library connects to a runnerx driver which contains this api uh, and the runnerx driver um, is performing operation on the system on the test and i brought a code snippet with an example how the runnerx driver is uh, set up so uh, we have a web driver remote then the address of the remote when you have the where we have the web driver then the browser name is runnerx uh, and then the follows uh, a few options from runnerx uh, for example the uh, application that we want to test if there are any additional arguments that we want to pass them force flag uh, set to true um, restarts the application so if the uh, suit is started uh, this flag forces it to restart and whitelist of applications uh, the list of applications that uh, um uh, robot that the driver can take into account and i think it's a time for a almost live presentation so here we have a code uh, so uh, and we uh, import the web driver in it we define the 
uh, Ranorex driver, so we said the remote, and the browser name is Ranorex. Uh, the application we want to automate is calculator, so it has the name. And this calculator has two names, actually calc or calculator in the whitelist, we use them both. And yeah, what do we want to do with this test? We want to click, we want to find number two button, and then after this we want to click it, then the click some several other buttons. We want to have the result of the uh, math behind it and yeah then we want to store the result and print it and uh, finally the driver close the uh, closes the applications so let's see how the scripts runs the, the calculator opens here's the math behind it and the uh, result is 32 and as you can see it's here printed as expected. And here's the same test but written in our Runorex driver library. So we import the library. Here are mm, the locators of the buttons that we want to click. And uh, yeah, also the display from which we want to have the result. In the setup, we uh, open the application. So it's the uh, name of the application, the location when, where it's stored. Um, then, yeah, set automation speed for one second because Runrex can be very fast, so uh, faster than a human eye. So we set the test automation speed to one second just to have a chance of seeing what is actually being performed. Then we have the click on the buttons, so the number two button, uh, number one, uh, multiply num the number two, and then equals in the end. So we want to again capture the result and uh, print it. And then in turn down, we close the applications. So let's see how this uh, robot test will work. So you can see that automation speed is one second, so it's waiting one second after each click. Yeah, and there you have it, the same result and as in the Python code. And the printed value is 32. So what were the main benefits of uh, the solution? First of all, it's, it's simple. Yeah, it's simple because and the technology of drivers, for example, Selenium, are widely uh, known, so to say, so the entry level uh, is easier. And yeah, we just need Python and uh, the Runorex driver, of course, the license for it. Um, easy to use selectors, so the uh, XPath like selectors, but I come to the um, back again later but yeah the easy to use selectors and the runnerx tools that make the whole um, um, automating process easier because uh, sometimes to get a selector can be hard but the uh, applications there is application like runnerx spy which helps you um, with interacting with uh, the application and the other thing, it's fast and efficient, so um, it's not that hard deploying and developing and extending in the uh, library as the uh, previous solutions. Here I wanted to show you the run of XPy. We want to track a um, button in application, so we just click, click track, then on the element that we want to track, and here you see the um, Runorex if XPath uh, is being collected from the application. So with this uh, XPath that was created, <clears throat> we can use it to interact with the application in our in our code in our test. 
so but everything also has its drawbacks so first of all RunnerX is a commercial tool so you need a license for it as I mentioned on the previous slide um, RunnerX functions are limited compared to uh, Selenium driver functions so we started to hitting the limits of a RunnerX driver getting the attribute uh, values from an element it's not always easy it can sometimes be really hard and yeah, we also are working on a solution how to make the process uh, easier and that part um, the most annoying thing uh, is that there is always the same error message so no matter what is wrong with the RunnerX driver the error message is always the same and that makes the debugging process uh, much harder um, RunnerX needs a computer screen unlocked while doing the test or it needs a RDP connection to a computer to a machine on which the tests run so we are also creating now a solution a service that is creating the connections uh, to um, via RDP to, to computers on which the tests uh, are performed and the last thing that RunnerX is only for Windows so if you have the need to automate mm, something on macOS uh, you cannot use uh, RunnerX driver for it yeah and if Robocon would take place about two months ago that would be the end of a story uh, but luckily it didn't and our story goes on it's time for version 4.0 why version 4.0 because like I said on the mm, with the runner X driver we were starting to hitting our limits so uh, we want to extend our runner X driver library uh, with PyAuto GUI which uh, comes into play uh, at that moment where RunnerX uh, doesn't cope and we have a remote uh, library to, um, to connect uh, to the applications um, one other part that is worth mentioning uh, in the solution 4.0 we are building on our previous solutions so uh, when you remember the solution 1 and 2 and then 3 all of them were approaches from a different angle and started from scratch so to say but um, this solution version 4.0 is building on our solution 3.0 and it's extending uh, it so how does it look like it's actually pretty much the same than as version 3.0 like mentioned uh, just a second ago um, uh, here is the part that you already seen because we have the RunnerX driver library with the web driver and it contain, contacts with uh, RunnerX driver and RunnerX driver uh, is conducting uh, tests on the system on the test and yeah that was the solution 3.0 in our full solution 4.0 we have additional PyAuto GUI so in Python GUI with the use of a remote library is connecting to the system on the test and performing those actions which um, which um, <laughs> which RunnerX driver cannot do and now an example of the RunnerX driver library 4.0 with the enhancement of PyAuto GUI so we download the library first and then we in the variables section we have the locators with which we want to interact and then in the test itself in the setup we open an application the application is RunnerX uh, demo app so it's an application you can download from the RunnerX page it's provided by RunnerX and it can help you get a feeling how 
does RunRex interact with an application? So if you want to try it out, the RunRex demo app is the best uh, place to start. So in the test, then we want to get the title and then we will move to and the move to keyword is using a screenshot of an element to locate it. So it's, it's interacting with a screenshot and uh, we then want to move to the reset button and we have the screenshots of this both uh, elements here and then we have we want to send a key sequence and the key sequence is Chris and the uh, enter your name field is the place you want to send it to then we have an element click based on image again so we can um, click basing of image then we change the uh, tab and perform a right click on the element and uh, then we again change the tab and uh, this time in the new tab we will do a double click on a tree element and then the driver, the application will close so let's see how the test works the application is open we move to the submit button the reset button no hands <laughs> yeah then the send key click submit the welcome uh, text change um, then do we change the mm, tab here the right click and we will change the tab again yeah and perform double click on the three element and the application will close so that is a quick glance what uh, the version 4.0 can do so we engage uh, Pyoto GUI to extend uh, the possibilities of our application like mentioned before uh, taking about the glance we can take a glance in the future also what we want to do is also to have a solution for uh, Mac OS uh, operating system so we have to perform the same tests on the uh, Apple environment and yeah, we are work looking for a solution for that luckily the power and beauty of uh, Robert framework is that everything apart from uh, GUI automation we can reuse from our uh, current test set yeah and maybe you're wondering uh, about uh, open sourcing the, uh, the library so unfortunately for now we cannot uh, open source the RunRex driver library um, yeah, because we still need to obtain the consent from our customer so thank you for listening i hope that you enjoyed this presentation again it was a great hon honor for me and yeah see you in a second in the live uh, q a session yeah and by the way i'm chris for the polish speakers krzysiek thank you and see you soon So please welcome Krzysztof uh, live for five minutes of uh, Q&A. We have some interesting Hi. questions this time. Uh, first of all, Ed Manlove is asking, is there an overlap in the keywords for your RunnerX driver library and other Windows application libraries? Mm. Yeah, yes, I, I think so, because you know, the keyword that we write, um, yeah, uh, self-explanatory so the um, keywords like click an element and get a text from an element and uh, such keywords they're probably yeah named the same way so it's probably overlapping yeah okay there is uh, also second part of the question can you easily switch between windows app libraries mm. yeah we the yeah, version 4.0, we are a part of using RunRex uh, web driver. We are using also PyApp to GUI. So there are basically two libraries behind that. And yeah, probably when we want to extend to uh, other systems, it will be probably yeah, also possible. All right. 
So can you use the XPath selectors directly from the helper application that you demonstrated uh, just directly or uh, does uh, it need some adjustment or intermediate step or do you have to escape this, those uh, selectors in some way? Mm, no, actually it was uh, it's quite easy, like I mentioned. So uh, when we identify an element so we can use the selector that is generated by it directly in the code. So sometimes you can even uh, make it a bit shorter. So cut off a little bit if you want to have a, a shorter XPad. But yeah, of course, you have to check if it's still working. But yeah, it's um, it's easy to use. You can use directly the gener generated XPad from the uh, SPY application. OK. Mm, there was also a question, how complex is the system that you are testing with this library? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was why in the presentation I presented how a printing uh, factory, so to say, uh, looks like. So there's many components, uh, many hardware components and uh, software uh, that are uh, driving this hardware and then interacting with each other. Uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, quite complex because yeah, the application that we test has um, also communicates to other software. <clears throat> sorry, and getting the responses from them. So I think it's rather complex. Okay, and uh, last question from the community: uh, Why wasn't the solution built with the uh, RunnerX driver in the first place? Yeah, it would be probably easier when it would be built from uh, with the RunnerX driver at first. But yeah, like mentioned, um, uh, when we just finished working on the solution 2.0 and uh, we have a switch in the uh, team uh, of the uh, person responsible, uh, then we just uh, saw that uh, RunnerX uh, uh, was informing that they plan to uh, Oh, uh, to release a uh, web uh, RunnerX driver. So at the solution one and two, no RunnerX driver was uh, available. That is why we had to uh, think of uh, another solution. And I think it's a good moment to close a door that I opened at the beginning of the presentation because I mentioned that the, uh, it's a tale about the continuous uh, research but uh, there are many more levels uh, to the story, just not just the continuous research. And I think the second very important level of the story is teamwork. Because yeah, uh, the colleagues that was changing, that were working on the uh, uh, solution were changing and the uh, teamwork uh, worked very well. So based on the previous solution, we can uh, go to another solution and think of some new ideas or approaches and i think that helped a lot by developing uh, the final solution that we have uh, right now so you would say it's uh, communication right yeah just like exactly. like lina uh, suggested in her talk okay yeah, exactly. uh, the five minutes q a session is uh, now over thank you krzysztof for for your attendance and for your presentation Thanks. it was very interesting and uh, right now we have uh, a couple of minutes of break and uh, we will see each other in some 10 minutes at 11.25. There will be uh, robot framework critique. So see you then and bye-bye. Bye.
Hello, and thank you for participation in the event. It's great to have you here. This is a technology-oriented conference, so it's safe for me to assume that we all have one thing in common. We use or want to use robot framework for various tasks. As with every technology, there are a few groups of users that we can distinguish. There are innovators and early adopters, the people who had used the technology before it was cool. Then we have early majority and late majority, and people who are reluctant to change or will not change their approach at all. Robot Framework had been around for close to 20 years now, and there are few among us that can call themselves early adopters. But is actually 20 years enough to be at the majority stage? We'll have to wait and see. Python wasn't in top 10 programming languages until 2001, and it took further 10 years for it to climb to top 5. There is one other thing that is certain in the IT world. People have preferences and quite strong opinions. That includes everything from the operating systems, like the Mac versus PC ad campaign, and uh, down to the editor battles, VI versus Emacs. 
One thing is for sure, the haters gonna hate. My name is Adam Hefner and I've been testing software since 2010. My interest in the field stems from being a Java developer for a year after completing my computer science degree. My development career started and ended in one of Polish startups and being in the team of four to five people with constant release pressure applied. I quickly noticed that our boss had preferred a so-called Klingon programming. For those unfamiliar with it, during such programming activity you can hear sentences like specifications are for the week or 4000 lines of code may be typed in one night by a fast coder. This very quickly turned my interest from how do I make software to how do I make software good. Since then, I've worked in Poland and Germany for various industries, mostly as a freelance test consultant, and I've seen nearly all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Scripted tests with estimated completion time of 12 hours, one monster automation script driven by hundreds of Excel files, exploratory testing done right and done terribly wrong, I've helped form or restructure the testing approach in some projects and adjusted myself to the leaders of my industry in the others. I've worked with developers or alongside developers. I've even accidentally weaponized Confluence to allow my team to go for continuous deployment that one time. My first contact with Robot Framework was in 2011, back when it was relatively fresh technology, but I can remember it making a lasting impression on me. So much, in fact, that whenever I had a free hand in selecting the technology of automated testing, I tended to select Robot Framework. Now I'm finally building the skills and competences of others in my team. I choose the way in which our company, Nice Project, can undertake further testing related to challenges and I carefully guide my colleagues toward interesting technologies. Robot Framework once again turned out to be one of the right choices for us, but with so many years under my belt, I've heard quite a lot of negative comments about my favorite tool. A relatively recent submission to Hacker News prompted me to deal with it, like once and for all. This talk will be dealing with critique, but I wanted to make sure that we have all the same understanding of the term here. In Polish language, we have one word, krytyka, that conveys two meanings, creating a critique, a systematic study of something written, or formulating a negative opinion about something. In English, those two meanings have two separate words to describe them, critique and criticism. You could say that this presentation will be a sum of both those meanings, a critique of criticism of robot framework, if you will, because I intend to take the negative comments about robot and investigate them for merit. Spoiler alert. Some negativity is well deserved, and I think that addressing it may make our community stronger and the product better for all. On the other hand, some negativity stems from ill-informed opinion or a lack of knowledge in the matter. And some of it is just a lot of bull. <clears throat> As the talk proceeds, I want to give you all a fair chance to participate and check sources for yourself in the future. I'll always include the link to the source that form the crux of the argument. Unfortunately, in the internet, the talk is cheap, so I will forced to paraphrase most of the arguments so that they fit on a slide. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the term death by PowerPoint and I do my best not to do it in here. Second of all, many things that I will say will sound negative, but there have been a, quite a few pats on the back for robot framework developers. I do my best to include those as well, so, you know, we keep the spirits high. And last of all, an image tells a thousand words. And did I mention that I didn't want to PowerPoint you to that? Yes, I did. So that's why I will use graphics sometime to convey how I feel about something or to explain my point of view. Now we're ready. Let's to look at from where I gathered my sources. If you didn't know Hacker News already, I may only encourage you to visit the page from time to time. It's a great source of news from our industry and a very helpful community of like-minded founders, software engineers, testers, technical writers, you name it. Basically, if your job has anything to do with engineering software, there is virtually no reason for you not to read it. Unless, of course, you value your time, because it is a huge time sink and quite addicting. Robot Framework has been submitted to the news at least twice. Both times, the reactions were, mildly put, interesting. 
Third source is a Reddit discussion which contains a surprisingly low amount of cat pictures in it. I guess the kittens don't sit particularly well with quality assurance crowd. Then there is a criticism of generally keyword-driven approach as a whole from Alan Richardson, also known as the evil tester, but it's not half as bad as it sounds. The HDEF site contains some points from a guy who was frustrated with robot framework and he decided to build his own tool. I don't judge, he has every right to do so as he pleased. But I felt somewhat called on when the marketing of his product is basically, it's not robot. And Quora, even though it's an old website with a very wide crowd, managed to round up a surprising amount of commentators in a question about our relatively niche technology. I should also say, this is by far not all the criticism out there. It's just what I found with some preliminary research. From what I, what, what I can tell, most other sites in the internet just repeat the same arguments, pro and cons, again and again. So it makes no sense to rehash it just for completeness sake. What do the people on the internet say? I've been very fond of Robot Framework for a long time. You can tell that the cartoon face on the screen is my face when I read some of the things. But enough chit chat. We're going in. Three, two, one. Let's start with something relatively mild. Burn it with fire. Look at it. Someone took extra effort to separate every word in it. And yet, no specific complaint, apart from it being used at Nokia, the company that helped create Robot Framework. Fortunately for us, the fellow commentators who shared the same sentiment and even often the same company background were quick to point out three critical flaws that they found painful to use. First of all, there is the issue of apparent informers enforcement of tabular test data structure. This is somewhat surprising to me because, as I see it, there are two main ways to define test case in robot. First of all, you can use the executable specification approach, where each sentence, each row in the test case is a sentence, and the sentence is meaningful, self-contained description of something that is useful to a stakeholder. With this approach, the test case does not even contain any tables. The second way is to use test case templates, the data-driven data approach. In this way, each test case is actually a set of test cases, and the tabular data format is absolute godsend and very wished for. But apart from the technicalities, let's wonder why would we want to have tabular test data at all? There are actually several reasons. First of all, the testing is a methodical approach to verification. That means that we have to, we should at least uh, apply test design techniques up front. And one of the test design techniques is called uh, decision tables testing. You may recall it from the ISAQB foundation. This technique is sometimes useful for increasing the test coverage with lots of inputs, and uh, this fits very well to the data-driven approach for uh, test drivers. The second reason for using the data tables would be specification by example and using the three amigos meetings to clarify the content of the test. Three amigos meetings are meetings that happen before the implementation even takes place. And they are used for product owner, developer and QA engineers, the titular three amigos, to come to a shared understanding what the request and functionality even does. You can think of them as a story refinement, but on steroids. The outcome of such a meeting is a set of acceptance tests and specific examples and test data. Unfortunately, those meetings are not so easy to achieve before, first of all, they have to take place before the implementation begins. So this eats up time before the, the sprint begins and they require the tester to have uh, quite advanced analytical skills, which comes with the experience. So uh, if you have a team that consists mainly of junior testers, it is not so easy to do. But when it works, it works wonders. Third reason for data tables is quite simple. If we have 
then we should use test oracles. Uh, those are applications or people that we trust to produce valid results for our application to test against. I have already mentioned that one of my past projects included hundreds of Excel files that contain very specific test cases. Those files were output from a legacy system and the new system had a requirement that all the results must match perfectly with the legacy software. So there was one huge script that consumed all the various and variously formatted Excel files and tested extensively the new software. It wasn't pretty, but it definitely worked for this particular application. Last reason, even if the product owner is not a fan of data tables, it often happens that the subject expert is familiar with at least Excel or something similar, and uh, we are able to prepare test data in cooperation with the subject expert based on their experience without requiring the subject expert to lay out every single line of thinking that they do in their heads. Mm, actually, expert-based testing is one of the best approaches that we can come up with. The fact that they may be unable to explain the algorithm does not mean that there is none. It just means that the algorithm has to be found and as much as the developers may be unwilling to accept this, it is our job to help developers fine-tune the algorithm to the expectation of the subject matter expert. The next point, difficult to use remote library. This is the kind of thing that someone who has never needed to use remote library would say. Let's split this argument in two. Mm. First of all, we have to wonder in what way we can interact with any system. Actually, there are many ways. Let me just list a few. Depending on the system under test, you could, for example, use a well-formed API like REST, SOAP, or GraphQL, or use a web interface or a web browser to do the automation, or use the native or close to native uh, UI interface and drive any kind of UI automation framework to do the automation, like Appium, for example. Uh, you could use the file system to move files around or write to, to or read the files directly. You could use custom protocols on any of the available ports. You could use the database to manipulate the test data directly and probably many, many more. Thinking about it more closely, things are easy as long as we are using well-formed, well-known protocols that define over the network usage. In every instance, when we have networked application that has custom protocol, then we are probably better off implementing a remote server. What this does for us is standardize the way we communicate with the remote machine. And our biggest problem becomes not how to communicate with our application that resides on a remote server, but how to deploy our Python application or Java application to the remote server. And this is a known and effectively solved issue. For an example, in one of our end-to-end -end test cases, we have to emulate simultaneous usage of the central server by multiple clients. This is <clears throat> actually effectively a load test case. The case is not complicated. The clients have to be connected and just communicate normally generating network load and some, uh, some load on the central server. Unfortunately, the server is legacy and does not comply with any modern standards. The starting of network clients is not possible remotely and uh, dynamically starting the client instances like in AWS is not feasible for us due to architecture constraints. So we can do one of several things. We could, for example, attempt to capture and replay network traffic, which can get complicated very quick as the traffic can be encrypted or seeded with unique identifiers, or actually the development of the client goes on and on and the 
captured traffic may become outdated. <clears throat> we could also develop and maintain emulators which will take care of the communication, which again requires additional maintenance and involvement of, of the developers. Or we could use a remote library to establish a well-formed protocol to remote machines and just start the clients there and stop them there. I have to add that the remote server is quite unique in the testing world. In other frameworks, if you want to open a communication channel to a remote machine, you have to take care of such communication yourself, and that is quite a different can of worms to open. Okay, the third argument, the imperfect lookup. I have to agree that the syntax support in IDEs remains one of the toughest problems in the road framework world to date. Fortunately, in the recent years, with development of more and more standardized IDEs, we've also received more and more standardized support for programming languages and robot framework is no exception. There is this thing called robot framework language server, which attempts to alleviate the pain here. It is currently it is currently closely bound to development of robot framework and it works relatively nice if the libraries and resources that we use in test cases are placed in somewhere that Python can find them. So in Python's Python path and not the robot framework's custom Python path. That is why I tend to encourage um, treating your libraries as software packages and just keep them installable via PIP. Another thing that can help during the development is quick keyword reference sheet. And this is very easy to do once we have the libraries and resources as installable packages and upload the documentation to one central place like the RF Hub 2. Okay, this is as much, as much criticism that I could extract from this URL, so let's go on. It's just Cucumber with extra steps. Now, now, let's not be quick to hate here. Cucumber actually did very much to popularize acceptance as driven development practices in our industry and it remains to be an extremely popular test specification format, even branching out to languages other than Ruby or Java. But I have to admit, I understand some of the criticism towards those solutions, especially when they spill over to affect robot framework. Let's look at them one after another. First of all, what does Cucumber do? It takes a set of natural text instructions with some placeholder and maps them to appropriate functions in the base programming language. There's a little bit of syntactic sugar that allows you to define extra steps or extra setup or background to scenarios or at data tables, but then it all directly maps keywords to the code. Additionally, to my knowledge, Cucumber encourages if not enforces flat test file structures. So in this manner, the feature file, as it's called, it's actually like English language, but then you have to immediately explain every sentence in very complicated code. In the robot framework, you have a little bit more flexibility. If the keyword is actually something that you'd call directly from underlying code, feel free. But even then you don't have to repeat yourself because function names are automatically translated to sensible defaults. But if your keyword is only a slight variation, or even better, a rephrasing of some other keyword, you can just wrap it in an extra thin robot framework layer. Then it's robot all the way down. I would even go as far as to discourage usage of library keywords in test cases. I often repeat, libraries have no place in my test suites. That extra layer of abstraction is also absent in robot framework. I mean, you can add it if you want to, but it's mostly unnecessary. Because of this flexible nature, we can implement in Python as much or as little as might make sense. Okay, little code reuse. I like this one. Cucumber forces in a way 
that the actual system usage is hidden from plain view because only the worthy will have en enough insight to carefully weave the programming language's functions to new keywords. And you face an interesting dilemma. You have to choose between using few, few keywords and rigid structure or loose structure and many keywords. kind of feels like there's no right or wrong answer here. Additionally, having set up somewhere somewhat localized to feature files doesn't do the code any favors in terms of reusability because you have to specify every setup separately. In theory, the scenarios should be short and understandable, but from my experience, few domains are explainable in such short terms. You usually need a bit more context. The robot framework with the nested test suites delivers exactly this context. If you need it, you can place your specification at the exactly right place. Okay, write the test code, write the glue code, intent matters, develops, prefer to code. It all seems like very slight um, variations to the same coin. Let's pick something from my industry, where we deal with printing presses. I can imagine crafting a keyword similar to print document or document is printed. They both make sense in various formulations of the test case. They are very similar in syntax and mainly they are, are both valid. I can imagine both being used to communicate the intent of what I want to achieve. But where is the context for how to the document should be printed? Maybe it's in a test case, or in the test suite name, or even worse, only in the documentation. That's the kind of things that you can do with Robot Framework. Have those keywords only test case specific, and they shouldn't land in any shared resource. What the resource should contain is specific keywords for printing the document in many ways, and the test engineer in the test same file as the test case should be able to determine which way to use in which test case because maybe there's one slow flow using the ui that should be used in specific cases and in the others you can use a workaround using some api because you don't care about all the details think about it some more how would we approach the same problem if the structure was more rigid we could define two keywords print document using UI and print document using API. And to further, document is printed using UI and document is printed using API. We wouldn't care that much if the content is same or similar. There are ways around it, but the test case designer and worst of all, the business subject matter expert has to remember always to specify which particular way is important to him and in what way he wants to have his document printed. And every other person reading the code will have the same instinctive question. Why are we using the UI here and not the API? The explanation to this question would have to be given in the comments, which is not quite optimal. This blurs the intent. The intent was to have the document printed. We should aim for providing sensible defaults and leave only so much usable information to the test reader as possible. We should backtrack here a little bit to the sad reality of multiple software projects. The truth is that the way to do the work is often figured out as we go and during implementation of the features. After a feature is implemented, testers test it first of all manually and select some keywords to automate the regression testing. Those keywords have to be then implemented in base language, pulling resources away from new and important features. So there is this instinct to not request new keywords. If similar are available, which can lead to the test cases that are kind of similar to what the tester had in mind. And of course, there's problem with the test bases. What, to, what do we test? It is often described separately and both the tests and the documentation have to be kept in sync with the development. What we end up with is quite curious. First, 
if we get lucky, some keywords are provided and implemented, often based on a hunch or informal communication. Then the test designer adjusts the test case to what's available to him at the time and implements the test. It's insane. What we can do using robot framework is much more sensible. We start by describing the test case in a most sensible way. Then we use keywords local to the test suite to specify intent in greater detail. And only then do we look for some keywords that may prove useful. Only if we don't find some keyword already implemented in the base library, do we switch to the base language to describe the missing link. All other can be built upon the way that we construct the test framework repository. This actually enables us to exit discussions with a plan, which is for all intents and purposes as good as a complete test suite. What's missing is the implementation detail. Our description of the test case may then be treated as an executable specification or automated acceptance test or basis for an automation. The simple switching of perspective brings us great value in construction of the automated test suite. There are also positive sides of being compared to Cucumber. Basically, all of its strengths are also robot framework strength. Probably the most important thing here is those frameworks force us to actually use words to describe behavior and expectations. This means that we have to have human discussion and communicate with one another. But where Cucumber forces us to pick and choose from a dictionary of sentences, Robot Frameworks enables us to be more creative with the test case definition. Details of the test cases will follow if they are necessary. This shared understanding between technical and non-technical project participants is important. It forces the developers to also think of the system in terms of clearly defined expectations as well as clearly defined interfaces. Last point from the attached discussion I found is very interesting. It was a comment that a low-code solution as robot framework should also understand context. These are the sentences like, if John logs in, he should see his profile page. In the last Robocon, there was this talk that actually proposed building such implicit context library. And the author of this talk actually came up with a proof of concept for robot framework. I have every intention to give it a go internally, but unfortunately we weren't able to allocate it allocate any resources to this effort this year, maybe next year. But even without this, using just the test case scope for variables enables us to not pollute the test cases with unnecessary details. The trick is not to use them in resource files, only in the test suite files. Anyway, my point was, it is com completely unknown to me if we were able to implement such interface, such implicit context way of thinking in Cucumber. Okay, that's it when it comes to comparison to Cucumber. Let's see what we have in store next. After comparing robot framework to Cucumber or other high-level test frameworks, it's only natural that some will complain about comparing robot framework with PyTest or any other low-level test framework. Just as PyTest, we could uh, use JUnit or NUnit or JES or Jasmine, etc. in here. The base comparison is we have already a language that we can implement our tests in. And this is true, we can do all the things and more with Robot Framework and with those low-level test frameworks. It is only a question of skill and maintainability. And yes, if we are employing Python developers already, we don't have a problem with them writing PyTests. Same goes for Java developers. 
uh, Java developers uh, are actually quite more happy with providing the JUnit tests as they are with providing Robot Framework or Cucumber tests. But if we were to think about it in detail, how many Java developers do you know that really embrace maintaining the Selenium test suite? There are also various different considerations. So, for example, the remote server for Robot Framework is one example that comes to mind. If you use the low-level test framework, you have to use all low-level solutions. Robot Framework requires some Python competence anyway. This is right, but the amount is negligible unless you want to do really wild things. I have already taught multiple people with limited Python knowledge basics how to extend Robot Framework. Comments after writing first Python keywords is usually, that's it. The most confusing part remains where to put the Python code anyway. Someone also mentioned that you need to be a developer to write good tests. I disagree with this sentiment. Actually, the developers are very needed in the software testing world, and we wouldn't have products without them to test. But the products that they provide need to be testable. We need their support to provide client libraries, mocks, simulators, etc. We need the developers to do good work and treat the testers as technical stakeholders in the product and maybe provide us with the debugging capabilities and clear error messages. I hate it when during the test of a web service, for example, I encounter only error 500, uh, the server has crashed with no, uh, no details inside. We need the developers to cooperate with us to fine-tune the requirements and discuss the scope of testing. Some tests will be better done in low-level test frameworks and some tests are better done in the high-level test frameworks. And some tests are best done manually only. We also need the developers to uh, use the unit testing and integration testing to drive the design of the system themselves. And most of all, we need the developers to cooperate with the testers, with the quality assurance team, and not treat us like some people that are out to get them and destroy the good work that they deliver. We have all have the same goal. We need to provide the best product possible. But actually, a sentiment that I can get behind is one of my colleagues from the team who mentioned that if you are a developer with good testing skill set, then you are a very good developer. And if you are a developer but do not approach your software and your product as a tester, then there is much to be done to improve your work. Another set of complaints is basically complaining about the rigidity of the uh, framework or complexity of the framework on, uh, or it being confusing. Basically, you cannot satisfy all people. Some will complain about it basing to being too strict and some will complain about it being too, too loose. Uh, some will find it too simple, some will find it too complex. But if we dig a little bit deeper in the argument, then we will find that basic complaint is the requirement to use double spaces. This is fair. You need to use double spaces in robot framework, but you could also complain about needing to use uh, tabs in Python or curly braces in Java or, or .NET. In my opinion, this is something that you just get used to. 
Also, the verbosity of the test definition language um, leads to favoring descriptions of what and not how. So I have seen cucumber tests, for example, where the setup's instructions for the test case consisted of 10 keywords. With robot framework, you can uh, just compose them to one or two keywords and explain yourself later in the file. Moreover, my recommendation is not to use overly complex keywords definition in the test. Uh, in my opinion, you should try to keep the keywords you use as simple as possible, at least on the test case level, and explain the details later as you go and deeper as you go. So it's completely fine to have all the details and all the possible default data in a low level resource that interfaces directly with some library. Uh, but if you are implementing a test case, you should only provide the most necessary details to, to the test case, the, the ones that are actually relevant to what you are describing. As for the structure, and formatting of the code. Uh, you can use something like Robot Framework Tidy and uh, actually automate the process. We internally use the git pre-commit hooks and those pre-commit hooks uh, work in such a way that they execute Robot Framework Tidy so that all the code is auto-formatted all the time. So we actually do not have to think about mm, if the conventions are being kept or if someone uh, forgot about two or four or six spaces or whatever we may use. And as to the complex control structures, my understanding is that they have been introduced mainly for the robotic process automation crowd, but there are times that they are useful in test cases as well. And actually, the way that ha they have been implemented in the robot framework with uh, ability to specify the X amount of executions or execution timeout, uh, I find it quite fun and useful. And actually, recently we had a test case that should wait for some visual cue from the software and if this visual cue doesn't go away after some time, then the process can continue and we should continue with the test case, but we should note the failure of one assertion. So this is one time that the execution timeout on a loop actually came in handy. A quite a common complaint is also the prolification of keywords. So what it means is basically every team that uh, approaches the system and the automation of the system creates his or hers or theirs variant of a keyword. So for example, someone asked, why do we have 18 different ways to log on or create a session? This is a very good question because how many different ways to log on to the system are there? Maybe there are 18 different ways to go, but most usually there will be one or two or three ways to perform some action and we should be able to execute each and every one of them, but decide during the test case definition which one do we actually want to use? Because maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't matter. In my opinion, the perfect solution is when the team that is responsible for some fragment of functionality maintains also the library and the keywords that describe how to use it. So maybe there are two teams, one responsible for API authentication, one responsible for the UI authentication. And each of those teams 
should be providing one package that we can use in order to um, verify if this way of the authentication works. Of course, we are speaking about authentication. It can be any other functionality. But the question comes up, how do you maintain your code? And the answer is, you create a package out of them. It is actually possible to package your libraries, so the most basic ways to interact with the system. And it is also possible to uh, package the resource files and the empty Python packages and also version them. And this way you can maintain a change log, you can maintain documentation, you can maintain um, basically the semantic versioning system and be able to tell the testers, hey, if you want to handle the new way of authentication to the system, you need to use the library in version X, Y, Z. The question that may come to mind when it comes to this uh, version packaging of the libraries and resources is how do we keep track of this? What's in which version? And the answer is we should treat the code of the libraries and code of the automation as our production code and actually provide the documentation in very great extent and use the toolset that comes with the community of robot framework and maybe push the documentation to RF Hub so that we can have one central location for maintaining all the uh, all the documentation of all the resources of all the files with the lookup function. In this way, when a test case is being actually implemented, not just designed our, but actually implemented, then you can look up which version of the library you need, place it in the requirements, and use the keyword directly as described in the documentation. A complex question in the robot framework world and generally in the end-to-end -end testing world is that debugging the test scripts is not an easy task and it often boils down to you make the fix, rerun the whole test suite and the fix is not valid, it's not fixed. You make the fix again and repeat the process and so until the fix is actually a good one. And a complaint that I've seen against the robot framework is that it is easy to make a mistake that a compiled language like Java would expose immediately on compile time. That is a fair point, but I think that we can do quite a lot with static analysis and we also can try to mitigate some of the problems with the dynamic analysis. So actually, Robot Framework comes with this option to execute a dry run, and this effectively will try to parse all the test suites and execute all the resources, but skip the execution of all the test libraries. So the whole flow will get executed, but no interaction with the system will take place. This can be used to verify syntax validity of the scripts and uh, try to pinpoint potential issues up front. I always encourage uh, my test automators to run the dry run as often as possible. We are actually looking into a way to uh, combine the dry run with the uh, pre-commit hook, but as we are using Robot Framework to execute various test cases in various scopes and use um, argument files extensively, this is not as easy as I would like it to be. More tricky question when it comes to making some fixes is assignment of variables. This is a good one 
and this is also something that needs to be taken with extra grain of salt especially if the variable assignments are done in a dynamic way using Python scripts. But what is good to remember is that the keywords can always reload some variables. So if you, for example, have variable files in YAML or you use the variable files that pull the data from some external resource, you can uh, use the keywords like uh, import variables to reload them to have the freshest state exactly where you need it. Then you can uh, make sure that no other keyword had polluted your namespace. Lastly, if we are doing as I propose and we are keeping the test libraries and test resources as packages that are installable, that means that we get to provide also a test suite and static testing of those uh, libraries and uh, test resources. And we should. Why not? After all, the test code is production code as well. So how does this look in practice? In our company, we try to extract as much library code as possible out from the test repositories. And we tend to have small libraries. Uh, some have even one or two keywords only, but they are extracted to separate repository. And this separate repository undergoes style, style verification and it undergoes uh, regular unit testing because libraries that we provide are generally in the form of uh, Python files. It is easy to do with PyTest. After that, we tend to provide the test libraries also with some simple robot framework tests. And this is actually a good example of how we can eat our own dog food, so to say, because if we can show using robot framework that we are able to use the library that we just provided with robot framework uh, then this already forms a good documentation for anyone that will want to use the library in the future the output of the robot framework tests and uh, creation of those usage examples is that at the end we generate and publish documentation of this library and push it to the RF Hub for all other testers to see. And a new versioned package of the library is published in our internal Nexus so that the people responsible for test design and test implementation can update at the time that is convenient to them. So it this doesn't have to be immediately, but uh, it tends to be quite quick after the uh, implementation of the new feature is complete. And this also means that we can um, maintain our library code quite clean if we sometime find an issue with the library code, as it happens, then we can uh, issue a bug fix for the library code and go on with the improved version. Sometimes people also complain about not being able to catch some problems with the uh, software early. With Robot Framework, we can get around uh, the problem quite easily. So first of all, what uh, we quite often do is set the log level uh, appropriately during our CI CD builds. And we leave those log files available only for a short time because we don't need to store all the details of execution. Uh, but after we are complete with all the relevant test executions, we combine the test reports into one test report and one test log. 
and during this uh, composition we remove the unnecessary details. The fact is that there are certain people responsible for reading certain types of files and reports. So we as testers and as test automators, we are interested in mostly the uh, working internals of the test case. So we want those trace results. But uh, the people responsible for maintaining the stability of the software are under test, they only want to have uh, some minor details about the test case and mainly from the business point of view. They do not care which request passed or failed. They want to know about the actual implication from the end user perspective. And this we can achieve using the set test message keyword and uh, actually by building up the execution report from the test case from the keywords. And uh, for our internal purposes, we uh, use the trace logs and analyze quite a different set of artifacts. Another thing that we can do to ease the analysis of errors is to always try to customize the assertion messages. It is quite easy to just uh, write should be empty, should be null, should be true, should be uh, greater than, and so on. But from the business perspective, it's quite difficult to pinpoint what the issue actually was if we do not add a little bit of context in these error messages. The built-in library already contains all the assertions that we could potentially need for most of the cases, and they all support custom messages, so let's use them. And last but not least, uh, when we are executing a test case, the biggest problem that I personally see is that the log file and the result file is written only after the test uh, run had been completed. If the test run doesn't complete in time or gets aborted by the CICD um, pipeline for any reason, like a timeout, then those log files will be lost forever. They simply won't be written to, to the disk. One way to mitigate this risk is to always use a de debug file uh, from Robot Framework when running the test. We can ignore it in the later stages of reporting, but for making sure what went on, this one artifact is extremely important and extremely useful from our perspective. Okay, it's getting quite late and I know that my voice is uh, has a tendency to put people to sleep when I speak slowly. So I wanted to leave this talk with a bit of advice. There has been some pieces of advice along the way, but this one is probably the most important that I can think of. This is something that I picked up uh, years ago and uh, actually, the longer I think about it, the more sense it makes to me. Uh, basically, when designing test cases and test suites and uh, the whole architecture of um, our test framework, we have to see our system under test synthetically and actually analyze which interfaces can we use to make contact with the system that we are testing. And those interfaces, as I mentioned in the beginning, are uh, quite many and uh, quite wide. And they are always very simple. So REST API is not that complicated. The file system is not that complicated. Database is actually not that complicated. And we can use libraries on the side of Robot Framework to communicate directly with those interfaces in most basic way possible. If you think about it, the Selenium library 
or browser library, it provides only the most basic ways to interact with a web page. The REST library, it provides only the most basic ways to uh, interact with a REST API, and so on and so forth. The operating system library provides most basic ways to interact with processes and files. This is a good thing and we should strive to emulate exactly this behavior. But on top of those libraries, we can create a dictionary of what makes sense in the context of our application and this library. So if, for example, we use REST library to describe how we want to interact with our system through the REST API, then this resource file above it, this one, for example, this can be used to describe the specific workflow, the creation of a resource, the deletion of a resource, the update of a resource, but this resource already has some meaning in context of our system. Then we can combine several of those low-level keywords, let's call them that, in the way that makes sense from the business perspective. So creation of a resource through REST API is usually not enough to accomplish some business goal. The business goal is, for example, a completion of a user workflow or creation of several resources or attempt to create some resources and rollback and assert the state of the system afterwards. And the user workflow that we can create, it may span several different interfaces. And the object models, for example, they are, from my perspective, also uh, some sort of user workflow. They describe the application from the end user perspective. And using those high-level resources, we can, in the end, finally provide our test cases, which will be described using the in-test-suite keywords. And those in-test-suite keywords, they, in turn, will use our high-level resources to accomplish workflow, workflows step by step. I hope this proposed architecture makes sense to you and if we stick to it then the life will be quite better. I guess the final word I had to say and want to, to share with you is the one that I already said a couple of times today and that the test code is actually production code and we should maintain good architecture of the test code and we should maintain good practices and we should maintain good um, quality of the test code and if we do then robot framework is a wonderful tool to work with and it doesn't matter if we use this or if we have one conversion convention or another convention uh, the, the goal is that we can use the collaboration tools provided by Robot Framework to make our life that much easier. Thank you for your attention and have a good, good, good conference. So, actually, we had some slight technical problems and we had to switch the person who will be asking me uh, your questions in the last minute, uh, but fortunately, Krzysztof agreed to to substitute. So, um, tell me what what do you want to know? So yeah, this time is the other way around. I'm the, asking the questions. <laughs> so, first question is that people say that robot framework is easy to start and hard to maintain as the test uh, grow. So, is it true? In my opinion, uh, this is true with every tool that you do not use wisely. Uh, so if you 
cram all your all your production code into one file or one class, then it becomes a hot mess. And the same is with robot framework tests or cucumber tests. If you just cram it all into one test case or one test suite and do not structure your code properly, then you end up with hot unmaintainable mess. So the, the goal is to apply your, your thinking uh, and architecture skills to actually describe your test cases and not the operations that you want to do with the system. And then you have the uh, clearer path to maintainability. Okay, so the next question is, was there a critique to which you changed your opinion? So example, for example, at first you didn't agree with it, but then thought it makes sense or the other way around? I had to think a long one about this one. Um, actually, the the one critique that uh, most nicely fits this description is the one that you don't have to be a developer to um, that do you have to be a developer to write good tests? Um, and it's not that you have to be a good developer to write tests, um, but you have to have some skills that are uh, inherently um, related to developing software to be able to architecture your tests properly. And uh, this is something that is uh, unfortunately not taught in all those um, online classes because it's easier to just show you how to get started with robot framework, how to get started with PyTest, how to get started with uh, Selenium. And you uh, have to figure it out for yourself, how to keep working productively with your uh, test code. And uh, we can learn from the developers the approach, but uh, unfortunately, there is uh, still a little bit too, uh, too little um, education in this uh, regard. Okay. And do you have one thing which would you like to be happy to implement in Robot Framework? It's a doozy. Uh, actually, I wrote four things uh, at once, but if I have to pick one, I would say I personally would like to have better manual testing support, maybe even exploratory testing support with Robot Framework. Uh, this is because uh, at our company, we have a lot of uh, business experts and uh, too little manpower to actually automate all the things that we want to automate. But uh, that tests should be executed in repeatable ways uh, anyway. And we would like to have an uh, integral overview of uh, what the test had been uh, executed and maybe combine it uh, also with the um, coverage reports. So. If we were able to uh, properly execute our manual tests as well as automated tests in, in one go and combine the reports in the end, it would be uh, very great. Mm, we already utilize in some uh, areas the, the uh, dialogues library from Robot Framework, uh, but it's uh, quite old and um, not anymore maintained. Mm, maybe we will develop something uh, on our own in this regard somewhere in the future. Okay. And um, which IDE uh, do you recommend for Robot Framework? I personally uh, do not see any um, added benefit of using advanced IDEs. So um, I recommend using either PyCharm or uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, because you can easily switch between the robot code and the uh, Python libraries if you need to. Uh, and it all also supports uh, developing the, the pipelines and all the other um, configuration files that you may need. And, and it's not limited to just robot framework then. OK, I think we can squeeze in one last question. Uh, which uh, CI CD tool do you use uh, with robot framework? It's uh, not that important. We, we use uh, GitLab, but you can use any one you want. Okay, I think that time for our QA session is up. So thank you for your answers and thank you for the interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your attention and thank you for stepping in, Krzysztof. Um, now <laughs> we have a 
scheduled a lunch break for one hour. So we see and hear each other at 12.30. Have a nice meal and smachnago.
Thank you.
RPA in the web. Hi, I'm glad to have the chance to speak in front of you today uh, and to show you one of my uh, recent project. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to shortly introduce myself to you. Uh, my name is Igor Czyrski and I'm a software quality engineer for a nice project company. Uh, I have not always been strictly involved in the IT industry. I started my career as an automation engineer uh, I've been involved with projects to improve the production process by implementing automation and robotization. Uh, mostly I was projecting automotive production stations. Uh, I've programmed robots and PLC controllers, but when my work began to focus on leading projects, I decided that I would rather focus on the technical aspects. Uh, programming was always something I was interested in, so I became a Python programmer. I've been a software developer for about a year, uh, but I've quickly realized that my personal traits could be useful in helping developers uh, to deliver robust and reliable software. That's how I became a software quality engineer. Uh, during my daily work, I use Python, Robot Framework, Ranorex, uh, CI-CD pipelines, Docker, and many more, depending on the actual client needs. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. What means RPI in the title? Uh, it is possible that some of you have not yet had to deal with this kind of software. Uh, RPI means Robotic Process Automation. Mm, this approach uh, involves usage of software to replace digital, tedious, and repetitive tasks. Uh, it can be integrated with both the backend, such as application databases, uh, or the frontend and desktop connections. Uh, it's gaining more and more popularity recently, so there are a lot of commercial as well as open source solutions. Uh, an example of such software is the uh, previously mentioned RunRx. Uh, RunRx is a low-code, no-code solution for automation of web and GUI applications. As the title says, today we will focus on automating tasks performed on the web with a robot framework. Uh, I will show you how I've managed to automate gathering Splunk charts, uh, but before we get to the technical part of the presentation, we need a brief introduction to the problem. Uh, I divided this section into the three main parts. Firstly, I want to show what is the Splunk in general for those who have not yet had any contact with it. 
Uh, then I will describe how my work used to look before I started working on the solution. Uh, and finally, I will tell you what were my main goals for the project and how I visualize it in my mind. Let's go. So what is the Splunk? Uh, Splunk is a software that helps to capture, index and correlate real-time data in a searchable repository. Uh, from which it can generate graphs, reports, alerts, uh, dashboards, and visualizations. Uh, it is mostly used for application management, security and compliance, uh, or the web analytics. Uh, of course, its applications are much, much broader. Uh, Splunk is a well-known tool used by many hefty companies around the globe, uh, and it is held in high esteem. For my purposes, it is used to collect performance data to then analyze and interpret it. But let's take a look at an example of the sample graph uh, generated using Splunk. Uh, this is the actual graph that I've downloaded from my test environment. Uh, it shows the disk activity, uh, the percentage of elapsed time that the selected disk drive was busy by reading or writing the request. Uh, this graph is one of the less complex ones. Uh, it shows only three types of data, one for each disk. Uh, but throughout the presentation, I will show you more elaborated examples. Uh, okay, so now when we know what Splunk is, uh, let's take a look at how my work used to look before my solution. Uh, generally, we can divide this process into three main steps. Uh, first one is strictly connected with the Splunk itself. Uh, to gather screenshots, a couple things need to be done. Uh, of course, at first we need to log into the Splunk. Then we need to prepare and provide arguments on the basis of which the graphs with data will be generated. Uh, those arguments are time frame as a day, month, month, year, or the period between two date times, uh, and the server or the machine which will be the source of the data. And then we have to go through all of the generated charts and analyze them. Uh, we need to focus not only on the overall chart, but we need to be meticulous on a single process line. I will show you that in a second. Uh, during or after that, we need to gather a screenshots of all the summary charts and all of the process lines that concern us. Uh, of course, gathered screenshots need to be secured, packed and transferred to the right place related to the JIRA ticket. Uh, and the final step is uh, report preparation. It all sounds so clear, but <laughs> let's talk a little about the weakness of this approach. Uh, Splunk works on a huge data sets, uh, very, very huge ones. Due to that, its responsiveness can sometimes be disappointing uh, and switching between charts, and we do it a lot, can take up to 30 seconds. Uh, this means the whole process of gathering the screenshots can take up to one hour. Also, the taking screenshots by hand is tedious and simply boring, uh, which means that mistakes can happen. And what's the most important uh, about this process, uh, this is the manual approach. So it makes a bottleneck on the test automation process. So now when we know the cons through the manual approach, Let's jump into completing the goals and projections. OK, so what did I want to achieve? Uh, I wanted to create library ready to be used directly from the command line. Uh, I decided that I want to write it as a robot framework tasks uh, extended with the power of Python. Uh, and of course, I wanted to make screenshots gathering uh, fully automatic. Uh, I will show you the reason why there are two types of the screenshots listed below. Uh, let's look at the graph which I've shown you before. Uh, again, it's the disk usage over time. Uh, summarizing the chart, on the top of the slide, we can see three data sets 
uh, overlapping each other. It's hard to clearly read and understand any of the information without analyzing it in more detail, uh, but that is where Splunk offers us the possibility uh, to the focus on a single graph at a time uh, by focusing the mouse pointer on the graph uh, label. Thanks to that, the graph can be divided into three separate graphs like in the pooled datasets beneath. Uh, if we have only three targets, it's not a, such a big deal. Uh, let's see how it will look like with more of them. Uh, in this dataset, we can see a graph with more than 30 processes in it. Now it's almost impossible to, to even see a single process. Uh, in my line of the work, uh, most of the graphs that I need to analyze look exactly like this. And of course, due to that, I didn't want to have a single screenshot of a summary chart. Uh, I wanted to have each of the process or disk to be on a separate screenshot. Uh, also, I wanted to generate a summarized report, which will be ready to attach to the final report, JIRA ticket or other test report metadata. Um, I wanted to achieve two approaches of application usage. First one, uh, triggered manually by the user directly from his console. Um, the second one, which allow us to fit it into the CI CD pipelines. Uh, and of course, one very important thing, at least from my point of view, uh, is of installation usage and overall satisfaction of users, which are my team members. Uh, it's always a good idea to maintain uh, good relations with colleagues. My solution is based on several technologies. Uh, of course, robot framework and Python. Uh, communication with the website will be done using Selenium. Uh, Selenium will be supported by Selenoid, uh, the Golang implementation of original Selenium hub code. Uh, it is using Docker to launch browsers, uh, and for us, it allows to execute applications on the GitLab runner machines. Uh, the user doesn't have to run code locally. Uh, instead, he can send uh, his order to the designated machines. And the application is packaged into a Python library via Poetry. Uh, and as the application needs to be executed automatically, uh, also GitLab CI CD pipelines have been used. To present to you the solution, I have decided to focus on a series of major elements and tasks of the program. Uh, we will go through the structure and flow of the application. I will show you how the application is packaged, uh, how it is installed and how it should be used. Uh, and of course, at the end, creme de la creme, the sweet and tasty results. Mm, the project structure can be divided into two main parts. Uh, the first one is uh, the operation of the application itself. Uh, the main pi file uh, is the script that oversees the library. Uh, it prepares the input arguments passed by the user, uh, it formats them, and most importantly, runs the robot tasks. Robot tasks files uh, import Python libraries, variables, and robot resources. The second part is the part responsible for deploying the library. Uh, I'm talking about YAM with the GitLab CI CD definition. Uh, after past unit and integration tests, as well as satisfying a couple of other requirements, uh, library is packed as defined in poetry toml uh, file. Okay, it's time to say something about general flow of the application. Uh, library is prepared for the two kinds of provided inputs. And the first one assumes uh, that the user wants to manually define the date times between which data will be gathered. Uh, the second one points to the robot report log file. Uh, the file will be analyzed to extract the start and end times of the test. Thanks to that, the application can be piped with the actual tests 
and collect information from their time span. As was mentioned, the main file prepares the library to start robot tasks. Uh, it detects manual uh, and automatic run. If the program is run by the user locally uh, in the CLI, uh, it will ask user to provide the Splunk username and password. Uh, before gathering the charts, the data sets need to be provided for the data driver. Uh, using the application configuration and Python functions, uh, relevant XML files are created. Uh, why are there two kinds of tasks? Uh, there are two types of charts. Uh, charts with the number of processes allowing to be shown on a single view and charts containing so much processes that they have to be divided into, into four separate views. Uh, it can be seen on the screenshot attached on the right. There is a drop down menu where you can choose uh, which which part of the data you want to analyze. Uh, after gathering the screenshots, the summary HTML output file is generated. From now, it is ready to be attached to the test report metadata, metadata uh, or JIRA tickets. This is the code of one of the tasks. Uh, I will not focus on the code at all, but I just want to show you what it looks like. Packaging and installation. If you want to modify the library, you need to create a fixed branch, a feature branch, branch in general. Uh, changes are pushed uh, out to the package repository manager only after the branch is merged into the master branch of the project. Before that, during merge request, code is not only reviewed, reviewed by one or more of the teammates. Uh, it must satisfy a couple of requirements. It must be checked by the static code analysis tools. Uh, integration and unit, unit tests need to be passed uh, and documentation needs to be generated. This way we can uh, reduce the risk of defects in the library. The library is stored in the general, uh, internal repository manager, uh, Nexus in my case. It can be downloaded and installed like any other Python library using a standard pip package installer. How to use this solution? Uh, I think that's quite easy. Uh, the application can be started just, uh, just as any other Python library. Uh, depending how you want to determine data gathering timeframes, you can call it, it in two ways. Uh, the first one, using start time and end time flags. Uh, this approach requires to specify manually the gathering timeframes. Uh, the second way points to the robot framework report log file from which gathering uh, timeframes will be taken out. Uh, if user is starting the library in his CLI, he will have to manually provide Splunk's username and password. But in the case of using the library with the help of CI-CD pipelines, an automatic run will be detected and the username and password would be determined from the CI-CD variables. As a result of the program, we've got the final outcome folder with the structure that you can see on the left part of the screen. Uh, there are folders uh, with the charts without the labels mentioned before. So the folder contains uh, screenshots directly. Uh, and there are folders containing subfolders for the, each of the process group. Uh, and screenshots are gathered in those subfolders. Overall, in my case, more than 20 folders and over 400 screenshots are collected each run. The HTML summary file generated at the end of the library run uh, embeds summary screenshots and basic run data 
e.g. the server from which data sets are gathered or the time frame of the gathered data. If the library is used during the pipeline, the results are stored as artifacts. As you have seen, the solution is not complicated or sophisticated, but it allows me to save a lot of time and nerves. Uh, the process, which take up to one hour of tedious attention require, requiring work, can now be run in the background and I have the time for a coffee. Uh, I mean other important tasks. Uh, results of the work are more consistent as they are gathered by robot. <laughs> Every screenshot is in the same size and, it's, and it is formatted the same way. The risk of making a mistake has been eliminated. Uh, the biggest benefit of this solution is the ability to react quickly for the requests of analyzing something. Let's say that the client suspects uh, that one process causes memo memory leakage. They have asked me to check that. With my tool, I will have the results in a short time and with little to no effort. Perfect. And that's pretty much I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your present and attention. If you have any further questions or queries, don't hesitate to contact me. See you soon. So welcome back. Mm, welcome, Igor. Hope you had a nice meal. <laughs> and this is the time for uh, a couple of questions from the audience. So first of all, um, how do you generate the HTML report and why is it separate from the mm, robot framework report? Yes, hello. Uh, it is separate because I tried to fit somehow the screenshots gathered from the Splunk into the uh, into the original uh, robot report file. Uh, it doesn't look so good. So I've decided that I wanted to create something that's my own. Uh, the generation of the file wasn't so, so hard and too complex because I've used a mustache uh, or the Chevron implementation of mustache template language. Uh, so it's it was quite easy. Uh, and of course, I used a open uh, uh, open source framework for the CSS, so it was uh, it was looking very nice. So that's that's why. Okay, what was most challenging in this project, and why do you need those screenshots anyway? Uh, so of course, screenshots are used by our client. In f at first, they are used by us to, to analyze the behavior of the environment. Then it's used, of course, by our clients. So they are, they are uh, very concerned about them. So they, they, want, us, they want us to, to, to gather and uh, capture them. Uh, uh, you've, you've asked what was the most difficult yeah, in the project. The most challenging part of the project. Mm, we need to. I need to clarify that this project wasn't so complex. It was. Uh, it was a pretty easy solution, uh, easy but powerful. Uh, so there wasn't too much uh, things that was uh, challenging. <laughs> uh, I think for me, uh, preparing the CSV file, which I used to to feed the data driver at the beginning of the of the script uh, i think that was the the most cumbersome part of the project for me but cumbersome and not difficult or challenging yeah yeah okay sometimes it has to be a little bit boring okay did you encounter any robot framework technical limitations that made it impossible or difficult to implement your ideas
So sorry for technical problems. Uh, I actually do not know where did we end. So Igor, can you bring me up to speed? There was a, there was internet hiccup on my side. Yeah, I was uh, I was a little scared that I've I, I haven't paid my bill, but I've checked and everything's fine. Uh, because there was some problems at, from my side too, so I don't know. Uh, you were asking me about the uh, technical limitations of robot framework, which I yes. yeah exactly uh, okay. So uh, as I said, the project wasn't too complex; it was pretty straightforward. So we, I haven't too much opportunities to overload the robot framework. Uh, on the contrary, uh, all the features and the behavior of the of the robot framework uh, made me work with it in this case uh, very well and easily. So I cannot say any bad words <laughs> uh, about the robot in this case. Okay. So thank you. We have still two minutes left uh, to um, to the next talk. So maybe let's give a short pause to our guests and see you in two minutes with the next presentation. Thank you and uh, thanks that you want to hear me. So bye bye bye. My name is Agnieszka Żmikowska. On a daily basis, I work at Capgemini as a tester. I am the leader of the test automation team in the project for public sector client from Germany. Privately, however, I am a mother of two boys who love Lego and help me prepare for this presentation, which you will see in a moment. At the beginning of my professional career, I worked as a manual tester but I quickly realized that automation is a way to make my work easier. So I started writing automated tests. Then I noticed that the next natural step in optimizing working time, accelerating the achievement of results is to maintain order in the framework, its structure and in the test code itself. Today, I want to present some life hacks that I hope help you not to waste time and focus on what is really important. So let's begin. As the first thing, I would like to recommend the use of pre-commit hooks. They allow you to automatically check the conditions what we consider important and useful in our project. For example, pre-commit hooks from the tidy library and auto-formatter that organized the uh, robot framework code. This is especially needed in a project where many automation testers work on it. It allows you to eliminate the maneuvers in running by individual people. It standardizes the code by keeping it consistent. Configurating pre-commit hooks took only a moment, but the benefits of using them cannot be overestimated. I think 
that the most people here are, fam are familiar with the problem of low and even medium priority bugs, which are not fixed right away because they are not a big problem from, for the application. They are stuck in the application and spoil the automated tests. I have to admit that it was a problem in almost every one of my projects. Together with the teams, we tried to deal with, with it in a different ways. We kept separate sheet in Excel where we wrote down the IDs of tests that failed and the corresponding IDs of bugs. Every morning when analyzing the nightly regression result, we compared our Excel sheet with the state from the report. We waste the time each morning. So we came to the conclusion that we need a tool that will show us directly in the report which test failed due to known bugs. It turned out that it ro in robot framework dealing with this problem is quite easy. This required writing a short Python code and using, using a keyword that already provides robot framework in this building library. And so the keyword check known bugs was created. It's triggered at the end of the test in teardown section. It checks whether the test contains a bug that is on the list of known bugs. This list is a text file which tester need to keep up to date. It's located in the automation test repository. If a bug is on the list, the set test message keyword from the building library is run and prints bug ID in the uh, report and the link to it to the tool where bugs are reported, for example, to Jira. I wanted to tell you about one of the default feature uh, functionalities that we didn't want in the project. One morning, while checking the result of the regression test report, we were disturbed by the huge amount of screenshots that were archived by the CI CD job. We wondered what happened in the application. There were over 600 screenshots, where the number of tests was around 100 and the number of failing tests uh, was not high. It didn't exceed 10%. After the investigation, it turned out that robot framework took screenshot in a loop after each failed iteration, which generate a large amount of archived screenshots that had information value for us. The solution turned out to be simple in the robot framework. We added at the beginning of the loop keyword, register keyword to run on failure with argument none, that turns off the screenshots. And finally, keyword register keyword to run on failure with argument capture page screenshot after the loop. That turns on the making screenshots back again. This saved us time for unnecessary screens investigation and space on the server disk as well. To gain time, you need to invite others to do some things without your help. The entire team, not just the tester, is responsible for the quality of the delivered software. So it is good that the configuration of the test environment also reflects these ideas. A good example is the CI-CD utility. Thanks to the use of tags from the robot framework, when running tests in a job, developers and manual testers can run any part of the tests grouped by tags so that each has a software quality control tool. It is not uh, the responsibility only of the automation tester team. The, uh, this helps to engage developers and manual testers to use automated tests within the long run will make them feel co-responsible for them. Another advantage is the ability to run one written test in a different environment. Imagine a situation where a developer wants to check if a feature he has just developed hasn't broken anything else. He can easily run automated regression tests or a selected part of them based on tag on his development environment. 
and detect inconsistence at a very early stage before it reaches a common integration environment. The next topic is locator. Locators are a very important element in UI automation. The traverse over the DOM tree is the everyday lives of UI automation tester. Well-written locators make your test stable. They don't need to be patched on UI changes. So avoid using flaky locators. Use that are not durable. Use reliable locators such as ID or name and keep developers adding them or you add them yourself to the application code. However, using the copy XPath option or some similar tools is a very bad practice and leads in the long run to a situation where the tester, instead of reading new script, corrects the locators. You will save time for cor corrections of constantly changing unstable locators. The next thing is to build custom keywords. The general rule is that one keyword should do one thing and use only the necessary numbers of parameters, the single responsibility principle. Often, however, the keyword is not too long at first, but over the time it grows, taking an additional responsibilities. This is a problem when tests want to call keyword to do one thing, but ultimately it will also do many other things. Maintaining such a keyword will also be a challenge. Of course, sometimes a more complex keyword is needed, but we build it by nesting the simple keywords like building blocks. Let's consider the case where a document must go through a three-stage verification process, uh, where a login user with specific permissions can check and approve or reject the document and pass it on the next person for the next verification stage. By creating one keyword for the whole process, we get a non-reusable and larger redundant method. To optimize this keyword, we divide it into smaller part of responsibility. Each stage of verification is a separate keyword and it built from specific methods of the website or a smaller part of the business cases. In the case of test automation, it's especially easy to get duplicates. Steps such as login and navigating common areas of the application are a natural part of most scenarios. Repeating the same logic over and over again in different places is the enemy of our time. If your application changes in this area, you will need to find all the places where this logic is duplicate in your test code and update them. To overcome this problem, separate the common code into their own methods, keywords. This way, the code existing only in one place. It can be easily used and updated as needed. Often, in such cases, keywords are extracted in the robot framework, basic ones often used in tests, such as wait and click, wait and input, scroll up, execute the database, and so on, to common files like common browser resources or common DB resources. A grouping of keywords locators in page, this obviously makes it easy to maintain your automation project. But page object pattern is not always the only right solution. It also has some disadvantages. When testing the UI, the architects of automation frameworks quite commonly use the page object pattern to model the test system. It is widely used because it's intuitive and easy to implement it, but it doesn't take into account business cases. This is a problem when we want to enrich our UI tests with lower API tests. To be honest, I use page object pattern, but as an additional support, I don't hold it too tight. 
Uh, when creating a Python library, whether based on function or classes, it is important that auxiliary functions methods are marked with the add non keyword decorator. Thanks to this, we will not clutter the library with unnecessary keyword to which we don't want to refer directly. Remember to use easy to understand name of keywords, variables, libraries. Use understandable name instead of comments. Name should indicate what, not how. For example, variable count doesn't say much what is stored in it. Uh, but when we change the name to, for example, rows count, it becomes cl clear what does the value represent. Avoid the hard-coded value in the code. First of all, hard-coded value makes the code less flexible, and there is a problem of searching through the code to adjust the value. Robot framework has the variable section, so when using variables, you can have all of them there or in a YAML file. Either way, you have them all in one place. To other aspect is that a hard-coded value often doesn't indicate what it means. But good variable names takes care of it. Assertions are a heart of each test. They confirm what are a set of test steps uh, lead to the expected state of the application. And that's the point of the matter. Assertions should be in the test, not in the keyword. When a keyword contains an assertion, it leads at least two problems. First, the keyword became less universal. When we want to use it in a different context, the assertion may not be met and the test will not pass. The passed or failed assessment of the application state should be triggered already in the test itself. Keywords without asserts are more universal. They can be used in a different context. The second issue is the readability of the test. When the assertion is hidden in the keyword, reading the test code, you can't see what and and as I said at the beginning, assertion is the essence of the test. It is worth to see it at first to look while reading the test. The test code itself should be readable. The keyword called in the test should focus on the responsibility and nothing else. Automated code moves much faster than we humans do. In a UI application, when a button is clicked, the application under test may need time to process the action, while the test code is ready for the next step. So you need to add passes or waits to your test code. However, adding a hard-coded wait time that tells the test script to wait for X seconds is not a good practice. This slows down the overall test execution time. In the case of a large set of tests, it saves a lot of time. To remove this code smell, consider using conditional wait technique. Many browser automation libraries, such as Selenium WebDriver, has methods to provide reasonable ways to wait for certain conditions to occur before proceeding the execution. Wait until element is visible, enable, and so on. Robot framework gives the possibilities to use Building keyword wait until element succeeds. Such techniques only wait so long as needed, nothing more or less. I will end at this, but I am sure that I haven't exhausted this topic because the possibilities of optimizing the test framework, improvements in the work of the automation tester are almost infinite. And what life hacks do you use in your work? So, hello, Agnieszka. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, great presentation. I really loved your remark on focusing <laughs> on the readability on, of the test code. Uh, it's so Thank often you. overlooked. Uh, and uh, yeah. I think I yeah. made a point of it uh, in my presentation as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is uh, also my uh, 
uh, observation. <clears throat> yeah, before I uh, start answering the question, I would like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to have a talk at the first Robot Framework Conference uh, in Wrocław. Uh, yeah, I, I hope the initiative will grow and I can't wait the second edition. Great to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, so first of all, there were several mentions of pre-commit hooks. Uh, do you and your team use some sort of software to manage them or are they uh, implemented in Git directly? Uh, yeah, we don't uh, use any special <clears throat> software, uh, just the pre-commit uh, application from uh, precommit.com. And uh, yeah, I uh, recommended starting from Tidy and other auto formatter like, uh, for example, Black, Black for uh, Python and getting uh, used to uh, pre-commits. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we decided to use pre-commit locally in uh, ID and uh, not in pipeline, yeah, because we would like to have more control uh, and see what is uh, changed by uh, pre-commit hooks. All right. Uh, I know this approach. It's, it's uh, very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly. My personal question, you got me intrigued by the um, known bugs uh, report. Uh, mm -hmm. What's more specifically in the text file that you maintain? Mm -hmm. I understand yeah. there's a gyro ticket, mm -hmm. but what exactly do, does do you mm -hmm. use to uh, figure out that uh, this failure is a known bug? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is um, what I uh, especially like in robot framework. Yeah, you can make uh, powerful things um, into uh, quite a simple way. So uh, in text file, we have the uh, test name uh, and the uh, uh, um, Jira ID of the bugs. Only these two columns uh, of value um, and keyword uh, written in Python, it uh, checks if car uh, current running test name is uh, in the uh, file. If yes, it creates a link to Jira based on uh, bug ID. Okay. Two more questions to go. Uh, so do you have any life hacks for cleaning up the Lego blocks? <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, especially difficult, but hmm, don't walk uh, barefoot into the children's room. Oh, that must be painful. <laughs> OK, and what's next in line for cleanup for your team? Uh, so what do you plan to eliminate next for, for, uh, for the mess uh, in, yeah, in your repository? The... Mm -hmm. uh, so we plan to implement the naming convention for keywords and variables. Our, our goal is to have keywords that sound like natural sentence, understandable for business stakeholders. I noticed that uh, it's hard to write uh, tests uh, that doesn't sound like a script language. Mm -hmm. the uh, test automation engineer um, have more technical point of view and uh, don't think really about uh, readability of code and they leave uh, in test uh, helper keywords like wait or, or click or even uh, SQL queries which should be hidden uh, and uh, it will save our time when BAs, managers or other non-technical person involved, involved uh, will uh, understand what does this do without our uh, support. So yeah, okay. that is, uh, that, that is I understand. <laughs> for the next future. Uh, we don't have any more questions. Thank you again uh, and see you around hopefully at the next Robocon. Yeah, at, at thank you. Latest. Thank you. Thank you for bye -bye. inviting me. Thank you. Bye. And right now in our schedule, we have um, a long block uh, dedicated to networking. So uh, I wanted to remind everyone that on the left side of your screen, you will find two hands shaking each other. And uh, there you can find the button, button for uh, speed networking, which will connect you to randomly chosen person that also clicked uh, speed networking. And I would like to invite you all to use this feature. I'm quite curious how it goes. Mm, there is a time limit for uh, this type of networking. So you will spend at most three minutes uh, with each other. Use this time wisely to uh, get connection to each other, exchange some uh, professional uh, profiles, and uh, hopefully this will 
grow your personal uh, knowledge network and um, all will have uh, the opportunity to um, become richer um, by, by this method. Uh, from my side, this is nearly all, but I will come back to, to the stage uh, in approximately 23 minutes to give the closing statement. And uh, for now, I thank you all. I head also to the speed networking. So if you have the chance to, uh, to meet me, we'll say hello and exchange some uh, contacts um, ourselves. Thank you and until later.
So welcome back after a little bit of networking. Um, hopefully you had the chance to meet some cool people and exchange some ideas and contacts. And I would like to once again, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, this event would not have taken place without you and your presence. Um, I hope to hear, you, hear from you soon and talk to you soon. Uh, you know where to look for us, uh, just 
reach out uh, using social networks or um, email. And um, if you want, there is uh, still time in the event for uh, networking and some of us will stay a little bit longer. Mm. We also will make the recordings available and uh, accessible for you all as soon as possible. Uh, I guess the platform needs a little bit of time to prepare those recordings and to cut them accordingly. Mm, and we have to download them and uh, publicize. And uh, I would also like to uh, ask you to fill in the, the polls and uh, vote for the favorite talk. Mm, I would like to add uh, to um, thank you for the great questions and uh, thank the presenters for great answers to those, those questions. It was a joy to uh, speak to you all. Mm, and as I said, talk to you all soon. Bye bye and have a nice day. I hope this day was uh, fine by your standards and it was a great day for me personally and for the organizing committee. Thank you and Bye.
Thank you.